Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, now we are going to hear an opening remark, which will be delivered by the Honorable Dean of Faculty of Law Universitas Pajajaran. Let us welcome Dr. Idris S. Uh, SHMH to the stage. Dr. Idris, the stage is now yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, of course, all praises be to Allah, the Lord of our uh, world, Almighty, because we have a lot of uh, blessing from Him, and also uh, the praying and greeting are always delivered to the great people, the great men, uh, Muhammad Wasallam, peace be upon Him. Of course, this morning, uh, academic activities is welcome because this is uh, uh, the best uh, lecture from any uh, prominent uh, 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 person, prominent speaker. And the secondly, of course, I would like to thank so much uh, from uh, prominent speaker, yeah. Dr. Gustav uh, Dung, yeah. Thanks so much because so many time we have come here to to share your uh, uh, your uh, insight and of course your uh, science. Doctor Gustav Bing is an international trade law consultant, uh, extraordinary lecturer in mercantile law, University of Pretoria, South Africa. Yeah, I think in South Africa is uh, the best one in terms of uh, trade. Yeah, and and also we, we have to cooperate directly with the, the state Indonesia and uh, South Africa. Uh, also, Bapak Wijayadi, SMMSC, terima kasih, thanks so much, Pak, uh, Pak Wijayadi, senior lecturer, senior international trade uh, defense analysis, uh, team leader. Uh, Mr. Joseph Wira Kues Naidi, thanks so much, uh, uh, Pak Yosef. You are a trade lawyer at uh, JWK Law. Yeah. Uh, yeah, your topic about the practice of uh, trade um, remedies, yeah, because the topic is challenging and attractive. Yeah, uh, trade remedies, yeah. uh, uh, anti dumping, uh, counterfeiting measure, and uh, safeguard rule. The the next uh, speaker is uh, Mister Ya Kristianto Tonggo uh, SLM. Terima kasih, thanks so much, Pak Kristianto. You are uh, our alumni, and of course, uh, your career will be uh, will be uh, followed by our student, ya, yeah? because uh, this country needs expert and uh, prominent lawyer, and hopefully the lawyer will come from Pajajaran University Faculty of Law. And also the the next uh, Miss Puji Andrina, yeah. Terima kasih, thanks so much, Miss Puji. You are third security and investigation and defense analysis, uh, junior expert, director of trade defense ministry of trade Republic Indonesia. Uh, and so moderator, Pak Musal Molana, yeah. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, and of course my beloved, my proud uh, student, yeah, and also happy audience, happy uh, our participant. This uh, lecture, this uh, uh, international trade lecture series, is uh, connected by Department of uh, Transform Business Law, uh, host, uh, led by Ibu Brita, Dr. Brita. Uh, Dr. Brita has just landed from Africa, America because you are uh, uh, representative of our uh, country, yeah, our also budget university, and uh, cooperation with uh, Rice, uh, Rice uh, Indonesia, and also with some uh, stakeholders. Uh, maybe is there any someone I don't mention about the uh, speaker? Okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, this morning topic is what I mentioned that attractive, interesting, and challenging because. The speaker, the prominent speaker, will discuss, will share about 
everything on trend. So we go from A to Z on uh, trend, especially trend uh, remedies. As well as not that WTO, uh, WTO is uh, an institution which organize everything related with uh, trade and also how uh, the members should obey the rule and the law. So if we don't obey or we are uh, get wrong about uh, interested, maybe our uh, country will be uh, sued in uh, what we call DSB. And now the member of WTO are uh, 164. Is it right, Pak Mursa? The, the member 164, yeah? And the members of WTO uh, are divided into what we call uh, three categories, yeah? A develop, uh, developing and transition economic countries, yeah? So one time, for example, what is, what is our position in, in, in the moment, at the moment? Is it uh, Indonesia is developed, developing or transition economic? Because yesterday uh, I've been to Dili. Yeah, Dili is uh, capital of Timor Leste, and uh, many years ago Timor Leste uh, was part of Indonesia. And until declaration uh, independent, almost 22 years, but not uh, not good uh, development. Yeah, because the, the 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 economy and trade should be uh, conducted seriously by. A state of Asia. Again, uh, of course, uh, I welcome this uh, international trade uh, lecture. And please, uh, my student, my beloved, my brother student, you can uh, ask more about the E pro E until Z about uh, trade, because WTO uh, allow the state to protect uh, domestic, yeah, good domestic uh, interest, national interest. In term, uh, of course, uh, uh, report the rule like. Uh, I said that can uh, we, we we protect our uh, good our economy in terms of dumping anti dumping uh, safeguard and everything. I think the topic of course should be uh, uh, discussed more by the uh, international speaker like what I mentioned before. Okay, uh, again thanks so much to Bu Brita, Bu Helita, uh, Nad, uh, Nad, Nadita, yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, from uh, Speaker uh, uh, Ministry of Trade Republic Indonesia, and of course, my student, you can pass on your study uh, by uh, making uh, the title from the perspective of this seminar. I think the topic, because what I mentioned, that's very interesting, and the topic can be a part of your final assignment, scripsi. So please, uh, you do uh, as soon as possible. Okay, therefore, uh, thanks to committee and of course, thank to all uh, uh, lecturer, to all uh, staff. And again, uh, this is not uh, the first one, but can follow the next uh, international public uh, series, especially on international trade law, international economic law, arbitration, and everything related with, uh, with the Department of uh, Traditional Business Law. I officially open the lecture. Thanks so much. Good luck. Enjoy the lecture. Terima kasih. Hatur nuhun. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Dr. Idris, for the kind words for our today's lecture. And the next one, I would like to invite the team leader of the Senior International Trade Defense Analyst. Please welcome Mr. Wijayadi, SAMSA, to the stage. Mr. Wijayadi, you are welcome to the stage. The stage is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, salam sejahtera bagi kita semua. Om Swastiastu, uh, nama budaya, salam uh, kebajikan. Uh, Bapak Ibu yang kami hormati dan adik-adik mahasiswa. Uh, uh, saya di sini mewakili uh, Bapak Direktur uh, Pengamanan Perdagangan untuk menyampaikan Uh, apa sambutan beliau kepada acara ini uh, yang kami hormati Dekan uh, Fakultas Hukum Universitas Pajajaran Bapak Dr. 
Dr. A. Idris SHMA, kemudian yang kami hormati Guru Besar Hukum Perdagangan Internasional, Bapak Profesor Huala Adolf SHLM PHD, yang kami hormati PLT Kepala Departemen Hukum Bisnis Internasional, Ibu Dr. Prita Amalia SHMH, kemudian yang kami hormati Senat Fakultas Hukum Universitas Pajajaran, Uh, yang kami hormati Rice Plus, uh, Export uh, Mr. Gustav Brink. Kemudian yang kami hormati Rice Plus Export uh, Bapak Joseph. Uh, kemudian hadirin sekalian serta adik-adik mahasiswa uh, yang hadir uh, baik secara luring maupun secara daring. Uh, puji dan syukur kita haturkan kepada Allah Subhanahu wa taala, uh, Tuhan Yang Maha Esa. Karena atas karunianya, kita semua dapat berkumpul bersama dalam acara kuliah umum, kuliah hukum perdagangan internasional dengan topik A to Z on trade remedies, anti-dumping, countervailing measure, and safeguard. Kenangkan saya untuk mewakili Bapak Nathan Kambunu, selaku Direktur Pengumuman Perdagangan membacakan kata sambutan beliau pada kuliah umum ini beliau sedianya akan hadir namun beliau karena tugas untuk mempersiapkan juga mempersiapkan sengketa 592 sama 593 sehingga beliau tidak bisa hadir beliau menyampaikan permohonan maaf Mungkin di lain kesempatan beliau akan hadir. Bapak Ibu yang kami hormati, kuliah umum ini merupakan bagian dari rangkaian penyusunan Trader Media Academy, model yang merupakan program kerjasama antara Direktur Pengamanan Perdagangan Kementerian Perdagangan, Merais Plus Indonesia, dan Tim Universitas Pajajaran guna mendapatkan input baik dari sivitas akademika uh, dalam implementasi pengejaran mengenai trade remedy uh, dalam kurikulum hukum perdagangan internasional. Kemudian sekalian, instrumen trade remedy anti-dumping, uh, anti-subsidi, dan safeguard awalnya disepakati sebagai instrumen untuk menjadi tools dalam menjaga dan melancarkan perdagangan internasional pada negara anggota WTO. Namun pada tentangnya instrumen ini menjadi hambatan perdagangan internasional akses pasar ekspor yang sering dihadapi oleh negara anggota termasuk Indonesia. Bahkan tren penggunaan instrumen ini oleh negara anggota WTO meningkat setiap tahunnya. Berdasarkan data Statistik WTO pada tahun 2020, penyelidikan trade remedy tercatat mencapai angka tertinggi sampai sepanjang sejarah WTO, yakni sebanyak 433 penyelidikan atau naik nyata nyaris dua kali lipat dari angka penyelidikan pada tahun 2019, yang tercatat sebesar 281 penyelidikan Walaupun angka ini menurun menjadi 209 penyelidikan pada tahun 2021, tetapi secara keseluruhan jumlah penyelidikan instrumen terdermati tercatat sangat tinggi. Selama tahun 1996 sampai dengan 2021, Indonesia juga tercatat telah menghadapi 242 penyelidikan anti-dumping, dan 30 penyelidikan tindakan imbalan atau anti-subsidi yang dilancarkan oleh negara mitra dagang terhadap ekspor Indonesia. Hadirin sekalian, sesuai amanat Undang-Undang nomor 7 tahun 2014 tentang perdagangan nah, fungsi pengamanan dan perlindungan perdagangan luar negeri diemban oleh tiga lembaga Direktorat Pengamanan Perdagangan, kemudian Komite Anti-Dumping Indonesia atau disingkat KADI, 
dan Komite Pengamanan Perdagangan Indonesia atau disingkat KPPI. KPI dan KPPI mempunyai fungsi perlindungan industri dalam negeri eh, akibat perusahaan barang impor ya. Kemudian eh, yang melakukan islam ini terutama yang kemudian termasuk yang mendapat eh, subsidi. Kemudian eh, eh, untuk DWP sendiri adalah me melakukan eh, bantuan Uh, apa uh, defend untuk Indonesia yang dituduh uh, trader di Direktur pengamanan dalam merupakan unit kerja yang mempunyai tugas pokok dan fungsi untuk mengamankan akses pasar ekspor Indonesia di pasar luar negeri apabila eks, uh, ekspor tersebut mengalami tambatan ekspor dalam bentuk tindakan anti dumping kemudian dan tindakan sebutan serta membantu para ekspor memiliki tindakan perdagangan dari negara lain hadirin sekalian periode Januari September 2022 ini direktorat kami telah menangani 27, 27 kasus trade remedy, 7 kasus sambatan teknis perdagangan, dan 2 kasus uh, penghindaran atau circumvention. Kita uh, kami sampaikan juga bahwa uh, kami berhasil menghentikan 11 kasus trade remedy. Jadi bukan hanya kami sih, kami bersama-sama dengan uh, para pihak terkait, terutama juga eksportir dan terutama juga layar-layar Indonesia, layar-layar luar negeri, kami bekerja sama dengan mereka untuk membantu menangani perkara ini. Sehingga kami bisa memenangkan 11 kasus untuk tertermedi, 5 kasus untuk hambatan teknis perdagangan, serta ada 7 kasus tertermedi yang berakhir dengan pengenaan. Jadi kita kadang menang, kadang kalah, dan kadang juga kita win-win solution. Jadi seperti itu, termasuk yang terakhir ini ada hambatan untuk produk mie ya di Hong Kong dan di Singapura itu juga sedang sedang kami tangani eh, bagaimana ini bisa eh, menjadi masalah di negara eh, tujuan ekspor. Kebetulan sekalian melihat semakin besarnya tantangan Indonesia di kancah perdagangan internasional, kami mendang perlu adanya Generasi-generasi penerus, generasi-generasi baru, akademis yang kuat di bidang hukum perdagangan internasional dalam kerangka WTO tentunya, terutama dalam spesialisasi untuk trade remedies. Karena merupakan kesempatan yang baik adanya kerjasama Rice Plus uh, dengan Direktorat Pengaman Perdagangan dan Universitas Pajajaran, dalam menyusun akademik modul on trade remedies yang terharapkan dapat dimanfaatkan dan diimplementasi dalam kurikulum akademis di seluruh Indonesia. Jadi ini adalah pilot project uh, untuk semoga nanti pembelajaran untuk uh, trade remedy bisa seragam semua universitas dan inilah menjadi pionir adalah pajajaran. Kami mohon tepuk tangan buat pajajaran. Tradisi yang kami harapkan dapat dimanfaatkan dan diimplementasi dalam kurikulum akademis seluruh Indonesia. Harapan lainnya uh, agar kurikulum modul ini juga dimanfaatkan oleh kampus ekonomi dan bisnis. Jadi ini satu tandem antara hukum dan uh, bisnis untuk memenangkan perkara. Jadi memang perkaranya perkara hukum, tetapi materinya adalah materi uh, bisnis, materi akuntansi. Jadi ini ada satu kolaborasi di dalam uh, memenangkan kasus untuk seperti itu. Uh, kemudian saya menyampaikan terima kasih dan penghargaan sebesar-besarnya kepada tim Fakultas Ekonomi, uh, maaf, tim Fakultas Hukum Universitas Pajajaran dan tim Rice Plus. Semoga ikhtiar ini bermanfaat. Wabillahi taufik wal hidayah. 
Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Direktur Pengamanan Perdagangan Natan Kambuno. Thank you very much, Mr. Wijaya, the SMSA, for the kind words. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are now entering our main agenda for our today's event. Now, please let us welcome our, moder our moderator for today, who will lead the discussion of our today's event. We already have Mr. Mursa Maulana SHMH here with us. Please do welcome Mr. Mursa Maulana to the stage now. Still doesn't work. Okay. Check. Okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to International Trade Law Lecture Series A to Z on International Trade uh, on Trade Remedies, Anti Dumping, Countervailing Measures, and Safeguards. And I would like to thank to Pawi Jayadi uh, as uh, you have uh, given uh, the welcoming speech for our student today, and also Ibu Prita as our Head of Department of Transnational Business Law Department, and also for all of the speakers today, I would like to welcome Gustav Prince and also uh, uh, Joseph and also Kang Tongo and Ibu Fuji. Okay, uh, before we start the presentation, I would like to invite uh, Gustav also to the uh, stage and uh, Tongo and also uh, Ibu Fuji and uh, Joseph, please. down is better yeah. okay thank you okay uh, today's topic is quite interesting previously you all have been given uh, at least you have known what is the wto wto is international organization dealing with international trade and on the first meeting you also have the seminar that given by Ibu Sinta Dewi, and I'm quite sure that you all has well, uh, you 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 have well equipped with uh, uh, how the WTO works and what is uh, WTO, how the WTO works, and also uh, the government issue uh, dealing in the WTO. And today we are about to discuss the specific issues is uh, trade remedies as. But which I already mentioned before, trade remedies is very, very important. And you know that trade liberalization has made all the country make the, uh, open the market to, uh, to every single exporter. And this is the rules. And as uh, yesterday, I and all the speakers uh, discussed about trade remedies and also including anti dumping, counter falling, and, and counter falling mission as and safeguard is quite technical and don't you worry today all, all of the speaker will uh, give the uh, how uh, uh, this agreement is governed by the WTO not only in international trade law perspective but also in Indonesia perspective because not only uh, uh, from the lecture but also from the uh, uh, practitioner like Joseph uh, is also quite Famous uh, uh, international trade law lawyers that will uh, be uh, here to deliver his speech about how uh, international trade law in Indonesia implemented and how Indonesia government faced a lot of dispute in WTO system settlement. Okay, without further ado, uh, please allow me to introduce our speakers today. First speaker is uh, 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 Dr. Gustav Brains. Okay, Gustav Brink holds uh, a BCom and LLB and LLD in international trade law from University of Pretoria, South Africa. In his LLB thesis, he undertook a comprehensive analysis on anti dumping system of the WTO, the EU, and the US and South Africa. He has been involved as either investigating officer with the South Africa Board and Tariff and Trade International Trade Administration Commission or as a consultant for domestic industry. He has been panelist in five WTO uh, dispute and acted as consultant on council for the parties in more 
WTO dispute, including in current in 2022 disputes. He is an extraordinary lecturer in mercantile law at the University of Pretoria and responsible for several LLD or PhD students on international trade law. And has published the only textbook on South Africa trade remedy system. Okay, please uh, applause to the uh, Gustav Brink. And our second speaker today is by Joseph Wirakusnadi. And perhaps all of you has uh, have known by uh, Joseph because by Joseph is uh, uh, the international trade lawyers that has represented in the Indonesian government in WTO. Please allow me to introduce you, Pajasep. And Pajasep uh, is the alumni of the Faculty of Law Universitas Indonesia. He holds a Bachelor of Law there. And after that, uh, Joseph uh, pursued his LLM degree at the Maastricht University. And Pajasep has a lot of uh, experience. Now he is the managing partner at GWK Law Office and also representing Domestic Producer Exporter Association in Government Indonesia in various anti-dumping, anti-subsidy, and safeguard proceedings, and also working at the, w, at the WTO in legal affairs. And uh, he also nominated by the Government Indonesia by WTO roster of panelists. Uh, uh, Joseph also uh, participated in summer course at the WTI, uh, the World Trade Institute in Bern, and also WTO with training on the WTO Agriculture, SPS, TBT, and TRIPS, and Academic of International Law, the Institute of European Study of Macau, and Negotiation and Decision Making Training, the European Institute of the Public Administration. Please give applause to Pajosep. Yeah. Our first speakers is our alumni. This is Bapak Christianto Tongo. Uh, Aris Sepabra uh, Sigalinging. Yes, and uh, now, uh, uh, please give applause to Pak Patongo. We are quite proud because uh, Patongo also discussed with me and Buprita. He always want to share his experience to our students. And fortunately, in this occasion, we are really appreciate Patongo. Welcome back to the campus. And, <laughs> Let me introduce Patongo. Now, Patongo is international trade negotiator on trade remedies in Indonesia in EU SEPA negotiations. And also, Patongo is international trade analyst uh, since uh, 2014 and until now, and international trade analyst, uh, Ministry of Trade of Republic Indonesia. Okay, thank you, Patongo, for your. Uh, time and also we do really hope that you will give inspiration for our student um, this is a lot of opportunities in international trade law and the last speaker is Ibu Fuji Andrina S-A-M-I-L-E Ibu Fuji is uh, analyst uh, investigation on uh, international trade minister he is the alumni of Universitas of Indonesia and also uh, received Master of International Law on Economic at the World Trade Institute. And uh, Ibu Budi has a lot of experience since uh, not only become the uh, representative of the Ministry of Trade, Ibu Budi also uh, has a lot of international uh, experience, including uh, participated in internship in the World Trade Organization and previously also the, uh, as the consultant in Deloitte in Indonesia. Okay, please give, give the last table, Fuji. Okay, without further ado, I would like to invite our first speakers, uh, Dr. Gustav Bring, to deliver his presentation. So Gustav Brings, the floor is yours. Yeah. I think it is about 40 minutes. Yeah, okay. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, there's no presentation, by the way. We'll just have a free discussion. First, let me just say that um, we part and getting to the latter part of a four year project, which is sponsored by the European Union, Arise Plus. Um, part of that, and the part that I'm working on and, and that my colleagues are working on, 
is on trade facilitation and on trade remedy. So we've over the past couple of years done quite a few things. We've been here 2019, then of course, unfortunately COVID, so couldn't come here, but still doing a lot of work from elsewhere. Having said that, having got the formalities out of the way, except thanking you myself for, for assisting us today, for being our moderator. Let's have a look at what trade remedies are. Are they important? Why are we here? Why are all of you here? If it wasn't for trade remedies, you would have paid a lot more for everything. Why? Because you're a WTO member, you reduced your tariffs. You agreed with all other countries in the world to have certain maximum or what we call bound rates on um, each and every one of your products. And you would have listed probably about 10 or 12,000 different products, technically negotiating on each and every one of them. You agree to relatively low tariffs on condition that if there were any problems, you could resort to trade remedies. So that then you could use anti-dumping, that you could use countervailing, or you could use safeguards. Without those, your duties would have been much higher. You would have paid more for imported goods. And if you pay more for imported goods, you also pay more for local goods because then people can just push up their prices to import parity. So to a certain extent, if it wasn't for trade remedies, you would have all been a lot worse off. Now, this is what the lawyers say. What do the economists say? The economists say trade remedies are bad for you. It decreases your GDP. But the thing is, they don't look at the impact of lowering the tariffs in the first place. So what we're going to look at today very quickly is what the different trade remedies are, how you can use them, why they're important. And I think then what is probably going to be more interesting to you is what can you do with trade remedies? Yes, you can finish your studies. And so what? What after? So we'll have a look at that. Of the three trade remedies, anti-dumping is by far the most used. Since 1995, when the WTO was established, we've had just over 6,500 investigations in the world. And those translated into about 4,500 anti-dumping duties being imposed. If we look at countervailing or anti-subsidy, as some countries call it, we only have about 400 investigations, of which about 250 resulted in measures. And then, and it's different, and I'll discuss that later when we get to that, Safeguards, we've had only about 280 cases thus far, of which around 190 resulted in measures, but it's counted differently. If I have an investigation on a specific product from five different countries in anti-dumping countervailing, that's counted as five investigations. So if you open an investigation against China, Vietnam, and India, that will be counted as three. Whereas in safeguard, that will be one investigation against the whole world. So just bear in mind that variance. So let's have a look at what dumping is, what anti-dumping is. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? What is dumping? In layman's terms, forget about what the WTO agreement said. In layman's terms, it's when I export at less than what I sell for in my own country. So I sell something for 100, I export for 80. Looking at it from a competition point of view, the difference is that competition law applies on internal transactions, so transactions within Indonesia. Dumping applies across borders. So th in theory, you could dump something by selling it at less in Jakarta than you're selling in Bandung. But of course, that will be treated with competition law. Dumping is not bad. And I think that's the first major issue that you have to take with you. Dumping is not a bad thing. If I dump a product in Indonesia, what happens? Price is lower. You can buy things cheaper and you have more money to spend on other things, which means you actually stimulate the economy by creating additional demand that would not have been there if your money was all paid for the product that was not done. But where anti-dumping comes in is if you have a domestic industry producing the like product. And now because of the dumping, that industry is being injured and you have companies closing down, you have people losing their jobs, et cetera. And that is when you can impose anti-dumping. So that's a very important distinction. Dumping per se is not a bad thing. 
in the past, if we go before um, WHO, there were a lot of distinctions between different types of dumping. So you had predatory dumping, which was termed very bad because you dump with the purpose of closing down a domestic industry so that you can raise prices afterwards. You had sporadic dumping or seasonal dumping. I produce too many products. I know that I'm going to sell 100,000 units. I'm selling, I'm producing 120,000 in case there are some quality claims or something like that. And at the end of the day, I have 10,000 units left. And if I sell them at one cent each, that's additional profit because I've already recovered my cost. The problem is that next year, I don't have an overrun. You no longer have an industry and now you have to pay full price. So those were termed bad dumping. Long-term dumping, on the other hand, was, well, we would continue dumping over many years and it's beneficial for the industry, for the importing country. But we no longer have those distinctions. Maybe also just very briefly, anti-dumping is only on trading goods. So there's no anti-dumping, no countervailing, no safeguard on trading services. It's a very important distinction. Again, prior to, to WHO, we had, well, certainly we in South Africa, had anti-dumping on exchange rate. We had anti-dumping on freight. So if you paid less than you should have paid for shipping, we could anti-dumping, could anti-dump you. But under the WTO, you cannot do that. Anymore. How do we determine whether dumping is taking place? If I sell a product in my market in South Africa for 115, and I export to you at 100, you're going to tell me there's dumping. I'm going to tell you there's no dumping. Because you have to compare the product that is sold domestically and the product that is exported under the same conditions. And we have a 15% value-added tax on domestic sales, but there's zero tax when I export. So that's the difference. That's not dumping. Because the company actually gets 100 in both instances. If I tell you that I will give you 1 billion rupiah, but you have a choice. Do you want the money today or do you want the money in a year's time? What are you going to tell me? Who wants it today? Nobody. Oh, they don't want money. <laughs> They're all rich. You're all going to tell me you want the money today. Why? Because you can buy a lot more with that money today than you will be able to buy with the same money in a year's time because of inflation. Or if you don't want to buy anything, you can go and put it in the bank, and in a year's time, you would have earned some interest on that. So if I sell something in my market for cash, let's say the price is 100. I export for 100, but I get 365 days to pay. I'm dumping, even though the prices are the same. You see, suddenly things become a little bit more complicated. When I sell something domestically and I pack it, it goes onto a pallet. It moves to you, the pallet comes back to me. When I export, it's on a pallet, the pallet does not come back to me. There's an additional cost. So suddenly what you find is you lawyers, but we start dealing with calculations. Anti-dumping is a legal agreement, but in practical purposes, it's about, I would say, 80% accountancy. So if you don't like figures, you'd have to join up with an accountant or with an economist because you have to understand these issues when you make your presentations. Or you get an accountant or an economist that will do the calculations for you and you then interpret that to make your legal submissions. If I look at the WHO, we have about 15 technical agreements. Other than GATT itself, the agreement that has been disputed the most is anti-dumping. Second most is subsidies and countervailing. And fourth is safeguards. And between those three agreements, they account for well over 50% of all disputes in the WHO. So don't think that there is not space for legal interpretation. Because if you have had so many disputes, it means that there are so many legal arguments that have been raised. And you start to read the reports. I don't know how many pages there are of reports on trade remedies. But for instance, 
just one report, and I know I'm taking an excessive example, but one report on the US steel safeguards is 1,500 pages. Most reports are somewhere between 150 and 300 pages. Lots and lots of legal arguments. So for you, once you've qualified, either if you become competition to Joseph, uh, he, he didn't hear that, <laughs> and, and you start arguing cases, or if you go to government, you start working for CARDI or for CARPPE, and you, you look at the arguments that are being raised by people, there's a lot of scope for work to analyze things, to see what type of arguments are raised, are these arguments valid, to have a look at what the WTO said, but is this a way that we can interpret it? Sometimes you'll see that panels will say, but in this instance, the authority could have done that. That means that they're not laying down an absolute rule. They're saying that under the conditions, under the facts that apply to this particular case, this is what we I've been on panels where we had very, very significant differences of opinion between the other panelists and myself, to the extent that I threatened to bring out a minority report. And then they said, okay, we, we, we agree with you, but we can't disagree with the appellate body, even though the appellate body has no um, started decisis, which means you cannot enforce the appellate body's um, findings on other panels. It's just a guideline. And then you find ways to get around that by saying, well, the facts in this case are different. And these are the differences, and therefore we make a different finding. I've done that in more than one of the panels that I've been involved in, yet I've still not issued a minority report because you find ways to rather deal with it. And that is exactly why you're studying law. You're looking at the different issues that you can argue. Let's quickly run through what anti-dumping, countervailing and safeguards are, because otherwise I think I won't do my job today. So I've already told you what dumping is, but if you want to impose anti-dumping measures, what you have to do is you have to prove three things in the WHO, but in Indonesia you have to prove four things. You have to prove that there's dumping. You have to prove that there's injury, either in the form of actual and present material injury, or there's a threat of injury, or that there's the retardation or the establishment of an industry in Indonesia. And then you have to link those two things. So you have to show that the dumping and not something else is causing the injury. In Indonesia, you also have to show that the anti-dumping measure is in the public interest. So that is your discretion. It's not a WTO requirement, but it's not against the WTO either. So it's your discretion. In the last anti-dumping case that's been finalized in South Africa, the authority recommended the imposition of duties for five years. It's on a basic food product. Following COVID, following um, very significant unemployment in the country, et cetera, the minister decided to suspend the imposition of the duty for one year. So it will be there for five years, but in the first year, there will be zero duties. That's public interest, even though technically we don't have that as a requirement. The big issue is how do you determine these things? Now, if you're going to read a typical textbook, it's going to show you that you have three domestic transactions, one at nine, one at 10, and one at 11. So the average price is 10. That's your normal value. On the export side, they're going to show you three transactions, and one was made at eight, and one at nine, and one at 10, and the average is nine. So the margin of, diff of dumping is 10 minus nine is one. You divide it by the export price, and you get 11.1%. But that is only in theory. Because in practice, if you have had very few import transactions, you might have had 100 or 200 or 500. Sometimes you have a couple of thousand transactions. I've had investigations where on the domestic side, so the normal value side, we've had more than a million transactions. Let's take a product that all of you know. Car tires. Are all tires the same? No. So you have a tire that goes onto a little Hyundai i10 or Hyundai Atos. You have a tire that goes onto a Lamborghini. 
they're not quite the same, but they all form part of one investigation. So now suddenly, when you make your calculations, you can't just take the average of prices on the domestic market and compare them to average prices on the export market. You now have to look at it on what we call a PCN basis, a product code number. Or in the United States, they talk about a control number, a condom. And you have to distinguish each and every single product and compare it with the identical or closest to identical product on the export market. And then you can have a thousand different products that are each being compared to each other. We're currently involved in a um, tire investigation. One of my clients has three and a half thousand different products. And you have to supply cost buildup for each and every one of those three and a half thousand products. Because without a cost buildup, you don't know what the exact costs are, what the adjustments are, et cetera. Once you start comparing them for each and every product, for each and every transaction, you have to start making adjustments. Because I could have sold the exact same product to different importers at different prices, different packaging, et cetera, different terms, days that they have to pay, et cetera. I can have warranties and guarantees on my domestic market. I don't have that in the export market. I can give commissions on my domestic market that I don't have on the export market. And so you start looking at all these different issues. People claim adjustments for advertising and you have to decide, but does advertising directly affect my price? If I spend $10 in advertising, am I going to sell 10 more units? What happens if I spend $100? Am I going to sell another 100 units or 11 units? You don't know, so it's not directly related. Now, just to show you the power of advertising, just so that you don't forget that. In the United States, you have two major beverage companies. You all know them, Coca-Cola and Pepsi. They used to have between 45 and 55% market share each. And then, not too many years ago, maybe 20 years ago, Pepsi decided, well, everybody knows Pepsi. We're not going to advertise in the US anymore. And we're going to save millions of dollars. What happened? They lost millions of sales. And Coca-Cola suddenly had a 70% market share and Pepsi was about 25 and they never recovered. So advertising is important, but you can't link a dollar spent to a sale made. Whereas if I'm paying commissions, so every unit you sell, I pay you a commission. That's directly related. Every unit I sell, this is the packaging cost. Every unit I sell, these are the transactional costs. Those are adjustments that you do make. You see, it becomes a little bit more complicated, which is exactly why people like me and Joseph love the area because it gives us a lot of work. And it's interesting. Every single case is different. Even if you work with the same product a couple of times, I've been involved now, this is my third tire investigation. Each of them is different. Every client is different. I've worked with poultry investigations, chickens on, the first investigation we had was 1999 against the United States. And we even got letters signed by President Clinton complaining about how we did the investigation, but they never challenged us. Then we had another investigation against three countries. Then we had a case against Brazil, which they took us to the WTO. Then we had another case against three other countries. We just finished another case against five countries. In between, we've got reviews of the duties. But each time you do it, it's different products, it's different exporters, it's different information. So it, it just keeps on going and it's, it's interesting every single time. It's not like, my, my mother used to be a lecturer at a university in my language. And in literature, every year, they had to prescribe um, nine books for the students. And some of the lecturers did the same nine books for 20 years. How boring would that be? Can you think if you do the same thing every single day? You'll never get 20 years experience you'll get one year's experience 20 times over. And that's not what you want. When we come to trade remedies, it's a very dynamic area. 
everything changes. There are new interpretations by the WTO. You have to look at that, read that. Oh, this is something the other party doesn't know. I start arguing that. Let's quickly move on to, no, let's finish something on anti-dumping first. Anti-dumping is very specifically aimed against companies. So you can have an investigation, for instance, against China, and you can find that one company is not dumping, and there are no duties against that company. Another company is dumping at 3%. It gets a duty of 3%. Another company is dumping at 20%. There's a 20% duty. Another company decided, oh, we're not going to cooperate. So what do you do? Oh, you give them 50% or 100%. You just have to be able to justify it, but they'll get a higher duty. When we get to countervailing, we're not saying that there's unfair trade by a company. We're saying that there's unfair trade by a government. So we say that the government of China, the government of India or whichever country is unfairly placing its exporters at an advantage vis-a-vis -vis producers in Indonesia. So for instance, if the government of China provides subsidies that reduces costs in China, they're going to be able to export at 80, but you're not going to be able to find dumping because the domestic price now is also 80. The problem is that you still have 100 costs, so you cannot compete against the 80. So now you have an investigation against them to prove how much subsidy is provided by government. And there are lots of rules as to how subsidies are defined, how you have to make your calculations, et cetera. And quite frankly, we don't have the time for that today. I mean, that alone would take several hours. But in the end, anti-dumping countervailing works essentially the same. Your injury determination, except for one small little thing, is identical. Your investigation processes, except for two small things, are identical. It's just that you determine subsidies versus dumping. The problem with a subsidy is that it can have an impact outside of just your own market. So China subsidizes a product by 20%. You can impose a countervailing duty on products from China into Indonesia. But what happens with your exports to the United States, where China now also exports at 80? You can challenge them in the WTO. So there's a multilateral route where you can challenge their subsidies to other countries. So that's, again, something else that you have to consider looking at the facts, do we bring a countervailing application? Do we look at multilateral track? Do we bring anti-dumping and countervailing at the same time? Because you can do that. How do, you, how do you deal with it if you have dumping from five countries, but subsidies only from one country? All of these are questions that you would need to answer after you've evaluated them, looked at what the best scenarios are. Um, sometimes you have a choice, for instance, if there's an export subsidy. So let's say the government pays 10% um, of your export price. So now that lowers your export price, now you can find either dumping or subsidies. Am I going to impose an anti-dumping duty or am I going to impose a countervailing duty? It's your choice. But it's easier to do an anti-dumping duty because it's not political. It's easier to renew after a review the anti-dumping duty for another five years than a subsidy because subsidies change over time. Anti-dumping and countervailing are regarded as unfair trade. Now, you won't find those words in the agreements, but you will actually find that the appellate body of the WTO has used those words. Safeguards, on the other hand, are used against fair trade. So essentially what I'm saying is I cannot compete against these imports. I need an opportunity to adjust so that once the safeguard measure lapses, my industry will again be able to compete against fair international trade. That again is the theory. What happens in practice very often is that countries use safeguards against dumping because they don't have to prove a normal value, they don't have to make all the adjustments, etc. But what happens is that you then often get caught in a net that's not supposed to be against you. And I'll give you one example where we had a safeguard which affected Indonesia. Um, 
that wonderful product that you showed yesterday that you said we can't see which product it was, lysine. We had a safeguard investigation against lysine. It happened to be our very first safeguard. Mm -hmm. And it was really aimed against one country. China. Who else? We're not China badgering yet, by the way. <laughs> What happened was that, and, and forget about exchange rates, imports from China came in at six rands 50. And for us, the exchange rate is about a thousand. So say six and a half thousand rupees per kilogram. From Indonesia, it came in at about 9,000. From Europe, it came in at about 10 and a half thousand. And from the US, it came in at about 12,000. Now we have a safeguard. And they decided to impose a safeguard measure of 27% on the basis of the average of import prices compared to how much protection the industry needs. So what happens? If you add, let's make it easy, 25%. If you add 25% to 12, you get another three. So now the import price from the US is suddenly 15. That's way more than the domestic price. So the US is completely out of the market. You add 25% to the 10.5 from the EU, and you have a price just above 12.5, 1262.5. They're out of the market. You impose 25% on the 9.5 from Indonesia, they're out of the market. You impose 25% against China, and guess what? Their price is still lower than the domestic industry. So all that you do in a case like that is you actually give the whole market to China. The country against which the whole thing was aimed in the first place. Now you've taken everybody else, including the domestic market out of or domestic industry out of the market, and you've given it away to the Chinese. By the time the safeguard lapsed, the domestic industry lapsed as well. They closed down. So we no longer have a lysine producer. Should a safeguard have been used? Well, it's highly debatable. Most probably what happened is it should have been an anti-dumping case against China. And if you use the safeguard, then you should have used a different type of safeguard. Because whereas with anti-dumping and countervailing, you have two different measures. You have a duty or you have a price undertaking in terms of which the exporter undertakes not to dump or to increase prices to a certain extent. Or in countervailing, either not to use the subsidies or to increase the price. And the government can also issue a price undertaking or to remove the subsidies. In safeguards, you have different options. You can use not only a duty, and a duty does not only have to be at the lorum, which means a percentage of the value of the imports. <coughs> Sorry. It can also be a variable duty. So you could say that imports must come in at 12 if your imports come in at 12 or above, there's no duty. If imports come in at 8, you're going to pay 4. If your imports come in at 5, you're going to pay 7. You can do that. But under safeguards, you can also impose volume restraints. It's the only place in the WTO where you can do that, because in terms of Article 11, you may not have um, volume restraints. Safeguards is an exception to that. So you can say that only a certain volume may be imported each year, and there are certain rules as to how to determine what that volume is. Or you can have a combination. So you can have what we call a tariff rate quota, whereby a certain volume comes in either without a duty or with a very low duty. And beyond that, you have a very high duty. And especially if you have an industry, let's say um, you have a paper industry that can only produce 60% of your paper needs. Why would you impose a duty on the 40% that has to come in? You then give a tariff rate quota for that 40%, which you can allocate between the countries that are exporting. But once it reaches that 40%, then you have a very high duty that discourages imports from other countries. You can apply all three of the remedies in the same case if you want. I've never seen that happen, though. But I have seen anti-dumping and countervailing applied together many times. I have seen anti-dumping and safeguards applied together. Okay. So Joseph says, and 
EU has imposed all three on the same product, on steel. You can do that, but you have different requirements that you have to meet in each and every instance. You have to prove that dumping is causing injury and not something else. You have to prove that subsidies are causing injury. Now, if you have anti-dumping and subsidy and countervailing on the same product, you actually have two causal link determinations already, which makes it a little bit more difficult. And if you then add on top your safeguard, it becomes a little bit more difficult even. The one thing that is very important is that when you establish a causal link, each time you have to prove that it's not something else that causes injury. Let's take Indonesia. You're a natural disaster prone country. You have earthquakes, you have volcanoes, you have tsunamis. What happens if a tsunami wipes out a city where they was one of the major domestic producers? And now the product that comes in, because now you have to import, that product is dumped. What caused the injury? It's not the dumping. So you have to very clearly look at what caused the injury. In South Africa at the moment, we don't really have electricity. We have what is called load shedding because the only um, electricity supply commission in the country is state-owned enterprise. It's been run into the ground because of corruption and everything. So we now produce less electricity than we did 25 years ago. But of course, we now have about 50% more people in the country than we had 25 years ago. So every day, each part of the country for two hours, you don't have power, and then you don't have power, and then you don't have. And sometimes it becomes worse. And recently, we had periods of up to eight hours without electricity on the day. Now, if I run a factory and I have to produce, but for eight hours a day, I cannot produce, my overheads go up. It's, you, you start running into questions as to what caused the injury. And these are the type of things that you would have to consider. Now, let's go and have a look at what you can do with trade remedies. I started out as a normal tariff investigating officer. So we increased and decreased duties and those type of things. And then we set up a specialist unit on trade remedies. And I was one of the founding members way back in 1992. First of all, for me, I have an accountancy background. So I majored in financial management and accountancy, and then I became a lawyer. I love to play with figures. If you look on my computer, you'll find just about everything I do. You have Excel documents and charts and everything. I love figures. So I, I know as a lawyer, I'm a complete anomaly. <laughs> But the thing is, for me, this is an area where I can really combine the economics or the accountancy and the law, which for me, is, it's been stimulating for the last 30 years, and it's an area I don't see myself moving away from. So I get a lot of job satisfaction. But when I started in government, I was really at a very, very junior position. I literally, when I started, earned about 10% more than the cleaning ladies received even though I had six years of study at university and they had zero. They hadn't even finished school. But then we started to do verifications because in each of these three instruments, you have to make sure that the information that you have is accurate. So you go on physical, on-site verifications. So at first, we obviously, we verified the domestic industry. So in, in your case, you now start traveling to other cities in Indonesia. In my case, we started traveling to Cape Town, which is one of the most beautiful cities in the world. And you go to Durban and you go to sometimes small little villages that otherwise you would never even get the opportunity to visit. And then you start going overseas. So the first time I went overseas for work, I went to Australia. And the one company that we verified was in a place that very few people actually get to, which is in Tasmania. So most people just get to, shall we call it continental Australia. We got to Tasmania. And then we had another verification in Sydney. And then we went to Perth. And you get nice PTMs as well. And you save that. And you suddenly have a bit of money as well. But you actually saw things such as the 
Sydney Harbour Bridge and the Opera House and things like that, which if I had to pay for myself, I probably would never have got there. And then you do a verification in Japan, and then you do a verification in France, and then from France you move to Portugal, etc. So as an investigating officer, I did verifications in 16 different countries. And in some of the, those countries, I went back two or three or four times and in different cities. I had one verification visit where the fact that my colleague and I didn't kill each other means that still today we're best friends. We traveled from South Africa to the United States. We did a week and a half of verifications there. Then we traveled to Belgium. We had a week and a half of verifications there. Then we went to Switzerland. Then we went to the UK. Then we went to Saudi Arabia. And then we went to the Arab Emirates, to Dubai. Seven weeks on the road. Not always that nice, but I can guarantee you, incredibly diverse. You get to see different cultures. You get to experience different food. You see things that you would never be able to see. And then I became a consultant. So now I work for exporting companies, et cetera, the last couple of years, more for governments. But I mean, in the last year, I've worked on three different investigations, three completely different products on literally three different continents. And you really get such an experience. They say that life is like a book. If you don't travel, you've read only one page. So trade remedies and international trade in general gives you that opportunity to read a whole chapter, to read two chapters. If you're lucky, maybe you can even read the whole book. And of course, now there's the big question, can you actually make money out of this? Maybe I should ask Joseph because, <laughs> because he can tell you what's happening in Indonesia. And obviously in Indonesia, you won't make as much money as you would make in, let's take the ultimate, the United States. In the United States, to defend a case, so if you're an exporter and you're accused of dumping, and you know how to defend your case, a small case is going to cost you $1 million. Now, obviously, that's not, that doesn't all go to Joseph. Um, some of it has to go to the accountant. Some of it has to go to the economist. But the lawyers there make incredibly good money. We cannot charge, well, literally about 10% of what they charge in the US. If I could charge $100,000 for a client, I would be very, very, very happy. Um, I think we get, a, we get about 5% of that. But anyway, the, the fact is that if you can establish yourself, and, and let's be honest, in Indonesia, you have two trade lawyers that have established themselves. Joseph is one, Eric Bunjiman is the other one. There's a lot of work. There's a lot of scope. I'm not saying he's a rich man. Maybe he is. Maybe he hides as well. But the fact is, he leads a... And, and you can't contradict me on this, I know. You have a, he has a very comfortable life. Let's be honest. I have a very comfortable life. I can afford to pay to go on holidays overseas if I want to. And we've done that. You make a good living. There's so much in international trade law. What, what I find in my country, and I heard yesterday the same is essentially here, most people that study law study corporate law. I'm not saying it's not important. It is. And you study tax law and you study labor law. Well, labor law in South Africa is very important. But at the end, you find that there are relatively few people that start to specialize in international trade law. And bear in mind that what we're doing here today, we're talking about three agreements. We're not talking sanitary, phytosanitary measures, technical barriers to trade, import licensing, value, um, customs valuation, et cetera. We're just talking about three of 15 agreements. So there's a lot more scope than just what we're doing as well. Trade law and international trade law is very, very wide. There are so many opportunities. But to a certain extent, it's also an underdeveloped field in the sense that there are not many people specializing in that, which means you would have to come and work for somebody like Joseph to get experience as a lawyer. 
I'm throwing you under the bus now. No. <laughs> Or you can work with Fuji and Christian to at DPP, or you go to Cardi or to KPPE, and you get that experience, and then you become a lawyer. But there really is a lot of scope. But sometimes it's not somebody's not going to feed you with a silver spoon and say, you will now be an international tra trade lawyer and you'll make a lot of money. It does take hard work. It does take specialization. But there are lots of opportunities, lots of job satisfaction, and lots and lots of stimulation. Because every day is different. Thank you, Gustav. What a great uh, what comprehensive overview on trade remedies, on uh, anti-dumping, on the following nature, and safeguard. And frankly, if you ask me to give this lecture in four minutes, it's, I think, I wouldn't be able to do so. <laughs> well, thank you once again to Augusta. And Gustav also mentioned that this is your opportunity. You can utilize this opportunity on the international trade law. Now, we will discuss about the trade remedies in Indonesia perspective, and particularly uh, from a, a lawyer perspective. This is by Joseph, now your turn to give our students your insight not only inside perhaps your motivation and try to pursue them to how to be international trade lawyers. Okay, without further ado, I just said the floor is yours. Terima kasih Pak Mursal, terima kasih Bu Prita, um, apa adik-adik sekalian, enggak juga ya. Ya, para mahasiswa sekalian. Gustav, uh, thank you very much for <laughs> I think you have explained in 40 minutes all the hard stuff as well as um, you are also trying to uh, provoke or trying to enlighten the students yeah of this new creature that we are doing right now yeah because I I believe most of the students will look up you know to maybe the, the most famous one is their alumni yeah hotman paris they want they want to have the ferrari they want to have the lamborghini so what you do you have to go to corporate you have to go to litigations but i don't think they ever imagine being a trade remedies lawyer so uh thank you gustav yeah so right now maybe i will only take 10 minutes maybe less yeah but because i i really hope to get questions from you yeah my my objective yeah titah dari pak wijaya di sama bu prita right now is at least to have one two or three of you yeah not to become master but you you have the interest so you will seek more so when you got this eight module from unpad consisting of 300 or almost 400 pages yeah you will have a lot of interest in really studying it because you have a goal oh i think i want to become this type of lawyer yeah that's 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 what i'm trying to do now yeah i'm not going to discuss about the substantive part how to conduct investigation and etc but at least my goal here to get to get your interest even thinking of pursuing this career because as gustav mentioned there is still a big opportunity in this especially in indonesia not that i love competition gustav. <laughs> don't get me wrong right uh, i i love the, I, I love the biopoly or monopoly in this field I mean, <laughs> but i think it's a good thing for our country competitions will make this particular sector even grow bigger yeah we cannot just only the both of us cannot really uh, build this market into you know something big yeah so i think there is a positive side but 
also you don't see this role as only legal practitioner as Gustav mentioned you have career like Pak Tonggo yeah in Ministry of Trade I mean he can explain more than me a lot of benefit I really envy him sometimes <laughs> you know he wants to go master degree PhD postdoctoral he just name it yeah without even having to I don't have money I don't have this I don't have this as long as you know I, I want to I just you know a lot of opportunity as a government official yeah you travel more than me yeah not only for disputes yeah but also for negotiations for training for etc they provide you with everything we are in the private sector we have to pay to get that kind of luxury yeah you have this gustav yeah gustav is a combination between everything <laughs> so if she's saying that he's not making more money than me i don't think it's true <laughs> so he become a panelist yeah at the wto he has become a lawyer for private practice yeah he has become a capacity building project like this helping university helping ministry around the world yeah so how to provoke you one thing is if you love travel if travel is your passion you want to go to places as gustav mentioned you never imagine you want you are willing to spend your money to go there <laughs> then this is the a, a, a right path for you <laughs> yeah I have to accompany Pak Wijayadi. I have to take six vaccine shot. Yeah. Just to go to Madagascar. No, this is not the Disney Pixar movie, right? <laughs> this is not like the, you know, uh, I like it movie, movie, this kind of stuff, you know. When you go there, you really see a third world country. Yeah. How poor that you can even see in indonesia yeah there we have the safeguard investigation on misadap super me yeah because that that's what they eat yeah we have safeguard investigation on sabun colek yeah that's our old days but there we are still exporting there yeah sabun economy b20 itu loh bu it that's what we defend there yeah because they are still using it there yeah so those kind of things that you love travel as bu puji pa ongo yeah pa tonggo and his colleague how many times per year they went to geneva it's like jakarta they only been to jatinangor one time right <laughs> ask them how many time they've been to switzerland no frequent there pa yeah at least three times per year maybe and fully paid right yeah. you and you got per diem as well <laughs> right some of them if you have a good uh, already high rank you travel with business class right so if you love travel yeah this is the things that i think like corporate you only you know in cubicle you will go you will go do diligence to to go to court you know all of this stuff but here very very big opportunity to travel to places that you can never imagine yeah that's one thing second thing no it's not the money yeah it's not the money the money is you know maybe uh, the third or the fourth yeah but there is at, at least from my own perspective i have this idealism yeah so called you feel proud when you can defend the interests of your own country yeah when you're doing corporate when you're doing litigation i think like even when you're doing moot court like what Unpad is famous for Jesup, right? Jesup is human right, all of these things. How many cases are there? Actually, yeah, you're going to be part of international level. Okay, we have Sipadan Lijitan, but it's how many years ago? Only one. Yeah. For WTO cases, at least 
ya only for trade remedies when you're defending your country ya before the international tribunal defending the interest of the good policy that being challenged by the greedy developed country who want to have access of all your raw material who want to have access to all the your market yeah this is some kind of pride although not every time you will win yeah because sometimes the rules yeah when 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 the government making a policy you have to take into account also the international rules yeah so that's a different type of uh a lawyering activity not always litigation but advising government yeah to to create a good policy i think it needs to be uh, uh strengthened right now yeah but at least for trade remedies what gustav has mentioned yeah we have at least seven wto cases ongoing right now we have trade remedies one non-trade remedies three coming up couples <laughs> yeah so you can see you will have you know not just mood court but a, a really first-hand experience on how you represent your country in international tribunal yeah that's i think something that you cannot buy yeah those are the idealism although sometimes maybe you're not winning all maybe you winning some maybe you lose all yeah but the government have trust on you yeah to defend our country because all of this policy is for the benefit of indonesian people as a whole maybe sometimes it can be in contradiction of international commitment but do you think us do you think eu do you think south africa is 100 good boy nah -uh. yeah we have sometimes we have to play smart i want to give you lots of numbers i want to give you uh, the numbers can translate on what would be uh your future career yeah how big it is why it's only two because if you compare to corporate you compare to uh, arbitration commercial arbitration yeah maybe the number is less yeah but the competition is also low so do you want to become big fish in a small pool or small fish in the big pool that's an option right yeah so i think i will leave there because i believe that more interesting to hear from fuji and from tongo and from you know to get your perspective yeah this is a new thing yeah i don't learn anti-dumping subsidy and safeguard in my university seeing all of you like this almost 100 or 200 here in person and maybe offline there are many more yeah either you are forced to be here because it is a mandatory otherwise you will fail ibu prita's lecture or <laughs> hopefully you have some interest in this yeah the second one is really my hacks i i'm not saying that all of you 100 200 will be interested in this my objective as i mentioned before one two three of you having interest i think it's already good yeah you don't own you you don't have to be lawyer you can be government official you can be a lecturer you can be anything but at least you are focusing in this area yeah it's i think the 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 uh, indonesia really needs young generations to focus and specialize in this pak mursal thank you very much okay.
Okay, thank you, Bajoseph. It's quite inspirative for our students. This is your opportunity. And Bajoseph also has declared that he's still open for competition. This is your time right now to prepare that. Okay, right now we uh, move to the next speakers. Uh, now uh, we will give the floor to Pa uh, Bufuji, Bufuji to uh, present uh, 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 to remedies in Indonesia perspective. Ibu Fuji, with our further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pak Mursal. Uh, terima kasih sebelumnya untuk Ibu Prita dan Pak Mursal yang juga tim Unpad yang sudah memberikan kesempatan kepada kami, tim dari Direktorat Pengamanan Perdagangan untuk uh, memberikan paparan terkait unit kami di kuliah umum ini. Uh, semoga nanti teman-teman lebih banyak lagi yang tertarik ya untuk mendalami isu-isu uh, terkait perdagangan internasional. Tapi sebelum saya mulai, saya mau coba tes ombak dulu nih. Ya. <laughs> Siapa di sini, tolong tunjuk tangannya ya, yang bercita-cita pengen jadi lawyer? Ayo, siapa? Aku pengen, pengen tahu aja dulu. Lawyer? <laughs> jadi baru lima orang nih yang bercita-cita jadi lawyer ya. Kalau yang bercita-cita jadi PNS... Banyak kan jadi PNS ya, bagus, bagus, bagus. Yang jadi PNS dapat door prize nanti. Iya, yang jadi PNS dapat door prize. <laughs> Kalau yang udah punya cita-cita pengen uh, ngambil jurusan perdagangan internasional, udah ada belum? Belum ya? Ayo dong, belum, belum tertarik nih setelah paparan dari Gustav dan juga Pak Joseph ya. mengambil. <laughs> Belum nih, semoga nanti setelah paparan dari saya dan Pak Tonggo lebih banyak lagi ya yang tertarik mengambil perdagangan internasional Banyak yang datang ke Bu Prita ya, daftar uh, ngambil kursus, eh ngambil pelajaran trader medis <laughs> Oke, okay. jadi uh, so uh, today uh, I and Pak Tonggo, Pak Christian Tonggo will explain you about the duty of the government of Indonesia in trader medis investigation So we are uh, now working on the Directorate of Trade Defense under the Directorate General of Uh, foreign trade. Next slide, please. Next slide. So to begin, I would like to explain you the the relevant authorities in Indonesia who are handling the trade remedies issue. So there are uh, two sides, offensive and defensive. According to the um, law number seven of 2014 regarding trade, especially on chapter nine, uh, article 67 to 72. So there are two offensive and defensive. So for the offensive, uh, there are two uh, institutions, namely KADI, Komite Anti-Dumping Indonesia, and also KPPI, Komite Pengamanan Perdagangan Indonesia. They both handle different uh, Determining instruments, so Kadi will um, uh, conduct investigation on anti-dumping investigation and anti-subsidy investigation, and for KPPI uh, they will conduct the safeguard investigation. And it's for the offensive meaning that they conduct investigation against import coming to Indonesia. So how? Uh, Who will protect the exporters of Indonesia who face trade remedy investigation from the other country? That is our job in the Ministry of Trade, uh, in the Directorate of Trade Defense. We defend the interest of the Indonesian exporters who face allegation of trade remedies from various countries. In addition, trade remedies, we also um, becoming the garda terdepan of Indonesian exporter who face other kind of barriers such as TBT, SPS, like maybe you know the case of uh, Misedap that has been mm, dit <laughs> ditarik ya dari from from the Singapore market uh, because of the some chemical con uh, ingredients uh, in the in the noodles. So we, we are the one who defend uh, the, the interest of the exporters. So In addition to the law number seven, there are also uh, another regulation related to trade remedies, including the law number seven on 1994, and also law number 10 on 1995. And the last one, we have a uh, government regulation number 34 on 2011 that mentioned that uh, regulates the, the investigation in trade remedies in Indonesia. So next slide, please. 
this is the figure i would like to show you how is the trending of threat remedy measures in 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 the world during the five uh, recent years so we can see from the figures um there is a positive trend right from 2017 there are there were only 20, 219 measures imposed by the wto members uh, on threat remedies then it continues to rise before it uh, a bit uh, slow down in 2019 and 2020 maybe because of the covid pandemic but you see in 2021 it raised significantly to 329 so if we uh, analyze end to end point from 2017 to 2021 there is an increase of 50.23% of the number of measures in the world. And if we compare between the instrument of threat remedies, we can see from the figure that anti-dumping is the most used uh, base uh, uh, used by the WTO, WTO members in the world. So uh, who are the global players who are initiating the implementing the threat remedies measures in the world? You can see from the slide, US, of course, <laughs> they impose already 210 during only the five years period. And the second is India and the third one, EU. And for the countervailing, we need the anti-subsidy investigation. US also still in the number one, uh, followed by Canada and India and also EU. For safeguard, we, we Indonesia is the number one <laughs> with 11 Please give some plus to Indonesia. <laughs> it's, it's, it is the work of KPPI who initiate investigation on safeguard against the uh, imported product and also Madagascar and Morocco. So you can see from the figures, right? Not only developed country use this 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 uh, instrument, also developing countries like Indonesia and also India, even least developed countries like Madagascar. So. Yeah, there are more for, uh, more country using this threat remedies uh, during the past five years. The next one, please. So this is the figure of which uh, sector that have been targeted the most uh, in the world. Uh, you can see from the figure it was metals like uh, iron and steel, uh, raw steel, uh, stainless steel, and so on, followed by chemicals. So for anti-dumping and CVD, metals uh, is the most targeted sector and chemicals. But for safeguard, during 2021, the most targeted uh, uh, sector is textile and articles and also metals. Next one, please. So we can so we have seen uh, the trend of the increase of the use of threat remedies in the world. So what is the position of Indonesia being the target country uh, from all of the country? See from the figures during since the creation of WTO in 1995 to 2021, Indonesia plays at the seven. Uh, uh, become the most targeted country in the world. So Indonesia have been targeted for 242 times for the anti-dumping investigation. And as mentioned by Gustav and also by Joseph, not uh, all the investigation will end to an imposition. Sometimes the, the authority uh, decided not to impose the measures because they couldn't find all the elements that are required by the the agreement then the, the measures is not imposed so from 242 initiation against indonesia only 158 ends um, uh, for the measures and you can see from the figures china is the most targeted country in the world for anti-dumping followed by korea and taipei the next one and for anti-subsidy Indonesia even placed at the fourth. See, Indonesia is really targeted very much by the uh, trading partner in the world. From 1995 to 2021, there were 30 cases initiated against Indonesia, but then only 13 
13 cases uh, were decided to be imposed uh, for the measures. So again, China still in the first place for the, the most targeted country in the world, followed by India and Korea. Uh, we cannot see the, the position of Indonesia because for the safeguard, because safeguard, as mentioned by Gustav and also by Joseph, is, is going to be imposed for the whole country, not specific country. Next one. So we have seen the, the position of Indonesia being targeted of threat remedies investigation from the other country. And here we see how many uh, investigation that Indonesia has initiated uh, during the five, uh, during the uh, recent five years. So Kadi, Komitan Tidamping Indonesia has initiated five cases in total for the past five years. And Indonesia has never initiated anti-subsidy investigation yet until now. And for safeguard, KPPI uh, has initiated a total of 11 investigation that place Indonesia as the most frequent users of safeguard measure in, in the world. The next slide, please. So here, um, the Directorate of Trade Defense, uh, our unit DPP, Directorate Pengamanan Perdagangan, as mentioned Pak, by Pak Wijayadi in his remarks, we face uh, numerous uh, trade remedy investigation from various countries and per September 2022, we are still facing around 36 cases, uh, consists of 27 trade remedy cases, uh, which, con which um, around 75% of our cases handled by DPP and another cases are seven cases for HTP means hambatan teknis perdagangan seperti isu-isu labeling atau isu-isu penarikan barang yang tidak sesuai dengan standar di negara mitra dagang. So we also handle cases other cases uh, other than trade remedies and we also handle two cases of circumvention. And during uh, this year, from January to September 2022, we've, we already, uh, we can say we, we managed to win uh, 11 cases of trade remedies, meaning that no imposition to Indonesian exported product, uh, while seven cases are decided to be imposed by the investigating authority and for uh, Hambatan Teknik Perdagangan, we, we managed to win five cases and zero cases was imposed. Next one. So as we mentioned before, there are still 20, around 27 cases ongoing uh, until September 2022. And we face various threat remedies from various countries. See, from South Africa, Africa Selatan, the country of Gustav, <laughs> and also America, Srikat, Australia, Brazil, Filipina, India. In India is one of the most uh, is one of country that targeted Indonesia the most for trade remedies investigation. We face also cases from Korea Selatan, Madagascar, Peru, Taiwan, Thailand, Turkey, Ukraine, Uni Eropa, and Vietnam. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I already um, show you some figures, and now uh, Pak Christianto turns to to show you how we managed to handle those cases. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bu Fuji. Uh, now, uh, Patongo will continue to the. Uh, his presentation about uh, trade remedies uh, based on Indonesia perspective and to Patongo is uh, the floor is yours. Pak. Thank you, Kang Mursal. Uh, terima kasih buat uh, Dekanat Fakultas Hukum Pajajaran sudah mengundang kami semua di sini dan juga terima kasih untuk Rice Plus yang juga sudah memfasilitasi uh, kami bisa tampil di sini. Uh, I will using English, Gustav. It means Indonesian English. So it's a bit <laughs> mixed between Indonesian and English. So Uh, tadi kita lihat teman-teman adik-adik itu ada yang pengen jadi lawyer. Ini lawyer apa nih? Lawyer bisnis kah? Lawyer kriminal kah? Ini international trade semua atau international law pada umumnya? 
atau seluruh campuran hukum hukum umum berarti ya hukum umum oke okay. uh, sedikit pengalaman saya dulu saya tuh waktu di sini tuh ini belum kampus di sini ini kampusnya bagus banget dulu kampus saya tuh di DU gitu terus kalau untuk perpustakanya we cannot borrow from the library we need to like borrow it for only an hour to get it copied uh, in any cop photocopy pap paper place in in the Patu Ukur so you have to be grateful and you have to use these facilities at, at your own benefit at the maximum uh, kalau kita bicara international trade itu nggak bicara melulu internasional secara publik if we talk about international trade law it's a bit mix of public international law and a private internet international law so a little bit creativity or no not a little bit a much of creativity is needed when you want to specialize in international trade law so if you can thank to the next slide so for us dpp we have three functions uh, to secure our export in the foreign market the first phase is during the investigations during the investigations we must coordinate with all the stakeholders for example in the anti-dumping procedures we have to coordinate with the uh the company that we being investigated or with the associations or even with the other ministry that uh that what's called like that covers the, the such sectors for example we need to coordinate with the ministry of industry and so on so what is what's the purpose roles during the investigation the purpose roles are to analyze every single document that presented during the, the investigation we need to find any weaknesses that was presented either by the petitioner i mean either by the in this, the domestic industry in the foreign country that currently initiate the investigation against indonesia or by the investigating authority we need to analyze every single document to find weaknesses so we are kind of like a detective and also like an economist and a lawyer in the same time so you cannot just read the the the, the, the agreement on anti-damping and you know exactly like the, the the agreement no because like gustav said there's many interpretations because w2 agreement my uh, my professors in in the university of indonesia say that w2 agreement is not pure legal instrument it's basically a mix of legal document and a mix of negotiation product so it opens for interpretations that's why in so many uh, panel report and so on you can find even though the product is the same you can find difference here difference in opinion and legal constructions so you don't you cannot be uh, a prominent lawyer like by joseph if you don't if you really only based on textbook so you have to find creativity you have to find legal weaknesses on logical behind every single document submitted to the government and that this the, the paper rules during the investigation so and then when we find any weaknesses we create what we call submissions defense submissions this defense submissions is vital for us to submit our defense to submit our positions against the investigations so this document is very vital for kalau kita ini mungkin lembar apa ya Pais? eksepsi ya kalau di ini di hukum kriminal eksepsi kali ya kalau di nah ya so ini seperti itu cuma instead of we uh, berhadapan dengan hakim tapi kita pertama berhadapan dulu dengan otoritasnya si investigasi ini dan beragam otoritas beragam kebijakan beragam aturan lalu bagaimana ketika penyelidikan ini selesai apakah dikenakan apa tidak dikenakan itu tergantung pada saat kita uh, membela uh, industri kita pada saat penyelidikan pada saat itu dikenakan misalnya the doors of BPP kembali lagi kita berkoordinasi we coordinate among the affected companies 
what will what will we will do in the uh, in the next step nanti dulu masih balik lagi shall we go to national court or shall we go straight to wto you have to uh, analyze the cost and benefit between the, these two roads so yeah the dpp will also be will be actively participating in making the defense after the investigation is finished and beyond that we are also participating in negotiating in diplomation so mungkin buat teman-teman ngerasa bahwa kalau kita belajar international law itu cuma perannya kementerian luar negeri no itu bukan cuma peran kementerian luar negeri kementerian perdagangan sangat aktif melakukan negosiasi di uh, perjanjian perdagangan internasional jadi kalau ada berita negosiasi perjanjian perdagangan internasional antara Indonesia dengan siapapun yang maju pertama itu adalah Kementerian Perdagangan. Kita garda terdepannya. Nah, apa peran DPP? Peran DPP adalah kita mengamankan akses pasar melalui kita mengusulkan proposal-proposal syarat-syarat atau pasal-pasal yang dapat menguntungkan Indonesia di bidang trade medis. Nah, di sini pentingnya teman-teman juga bukan hanya belajar tentang agreement WTO, tetapi juga foreign regulation yang ada di negara-negara mitra. Contoh, saat ini saya lagi aktif uh, bernegosiasi dengan Uni Eropa. Benar Pak, Joseph saya udah berulak balik ke Brussels. Ya, <laughs> ya. Ah. kalau <laughs> jadi nanggung bagus sekali. <laughs> kalau ke Brussels adalah ya empat kali lah. Jadi dan kita bernegosiasi di sana, tapi kita nggak bisa bernegosiasi dengan tangan kosong dan kepala kosong. Saya harus membaca aturan Uni Eropa dari yang pertama sampai yang terbaru, bahkan sampai draftnya pun yang akan mereka aplikasikan terkait terkait medis. Sehingga saya bisa ketika melakukan negosiasi, saya nggak bisa dibodoh-bodohin sama Uni Eropa. Saya bisa challenge, oh aturan kamu, kamu mungkin aturan baru nih. Kayaknya yang akan mengecewakan Indonesia. Contoh, nanti teman-teman kalau misalnya tertarik, sekarang itu Uni Eropa, not right now Uni Eropa has applied one new regulations in anti-dumping that was quite uh, contentious. There are new terminology there called significant distortions and uh, distortions in uh, raw materials. And there's the third party is government interventions. This Terminologies are quite different than the one particular terminology called particular market situations that already existed in anti-dumping agreement. So, sesuatu yang baru, sesuatu yang develop, sesuatu yang mungkin nggak ada di textbook teman-teman, tapi itu menarik untuk kita lihat gitu loh. Dan itu jadi bisa ke teman-teman mudah-mudahan ya teman-teman akan tertarik apalagi kalau misalnya suka melihat perbandingan memperbandingkan perbandingan hukum satu dengan hukum yang lain misalkan gitu itu akan sangat menarik lalu sekarang misalnya nih Uni Eropa sekarang punya uh, cara lagi untuk menekan investasi negara asing di negara yang lain misalnya mereka gunakan namanya third country subsidies which is something new completely different dan itu bisa menjadi kayak kalau kita bicara kayak Marvel itu kayak crossover between investment law and uh, subsidy countervailing measure subsidy agreement so there's this there's new development currently being developed in the role of international trade law dan itu sangat menarik buat teman-teman kalau sekarang masih bingung International trade itu menariknya apa sih? Bukan cuma investasi, bukan cuma arbitrasi, bukan cuma humanitarian, tetapi international trade law. Bahkan kalau saya pribadi mengatakan trade itu bisa jadi salah satu cara untuk berdiplomasi dan bernegosiasi, bukan cuma dengan cara hak asasi manusia dan segala macam. Gitu. Jadi kita mau mengajak teman-teman untuk ke, untuk aktif, untuk punya appetite berkecimpung di sini karena eh, ahlinya nggak banyak. Praktisinya nggak banyak dan kami butuh generasi-generasi baru yang untuk masuk ke perdagangan untuk bisa ya kita mimpi kami sih ada teman-teman yang nanti bisa jadi in-house lawyernya pemerintah.
karena seperti beberapa negara itu mereka ketika bersengketa di WTO mereka menggunakan in-house lawyer yang dari pemerintah sendiri bukan private lawyer dan segala macam Wah, maaf ya Pak bukan bukan berarti saya mau mengambil kompetisi Pak Joseph tapi maksud saya adalah kalau mau jadi Pak Joseph bisa kalau mau jadi kami juga bisa kalau mau jadi seperti Gustav juga bisa semuanya masa depan itu terbuka luas gitu loh dan internasional trade law itu sangat 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 menarik mungkin lanjut ya ini ke ininya ini sekedar foto-foto nih ya nah, ini kita lagi ya tadi saya agak restless agak gelisah itu saya lagi menyusun surat menteri untuk dikirim ke India tergant terkait salah satu produk yang sedang lagi di diinvestigasi nah inilah dinamika yang sekarang biasanya terjadi biasanya kita nanti pada saat penyelidikan kita biasanya ada rapat koordinasi bahkan kita ketika pihak penyelidik dari negara lain itu bisa datang ke Indonesia dan kita harus memberikan informasi seluas-luasnya lanjut nah ini bentuk submisi nah kita misalnya kita menerbitkan ke Ankara terus kita menerbitkan ke South Africa kita terbitkan juga ke India submisi inilah kertas pembelaan pemerintah ini yang membentuk Inilah dasar pertama kita membela akses ekspor pasar kita ke luar negeri. Dan ini bukan cuma opini hukum yang ada di sini, tetapi juga data-data statistik, data-data ekonomi yang sangat menguatkan teman uh, ekspor kita dan bisa juga menentukan apakah kita berhasil atau tidak dalam melakukan pembelaan. Jadi ketika teman-teman nanti akan berkecimpung di internasional trade law, teman-teman tidak hanya belajar mengenai law-nya murni, tetapi juga mengenai ekonominya, mengenai bisnisnya, mengenai akuntansinya, bahkan mengenai aspek-aspek lain yang mungkin bisa, misalnya geopolitiknya bisa kalian masukin di sini. Jadi ini sangat-sangat kompleks dan sangat-sangat menarik. Lanjut. Nah ini foto-foto kita, ini produk kaca Ibu Uji berhasil dihentikan. Uh, di Filipina waktu itu, dan ini dia datang ke Filipina nih. Nah, yang ini saya waktu itu yang lagi nanganin kasus biodiesel, tapi bukan trade remedies. Ini dengan temannya Pak Joseph, Pak Eri Bunjamin. Ya, ini foto lama, Pak. Ya, gitu ya. Jadi, ini kita lagi ke Korea, jadi kita ketemu opa-opa di sini ya kan? Ya, sarangnya semua. Terus lanjut. Nah, ini, ini juga ketika kita bernegosiasi dengan... Filipin terkait special safeguard measures. Kopi instan kita itu sempat tertahan di Filipina sampai saat ini. Ada beberapa foto lain yang nggak bisa kita ini. Contohnya kita juga sempat dulu sempat nggak bisa ekspor mobil ke Vietnam. Dan kai saya juga dengan Pak Wijayadi itu sempat berangkat ke Vietnam untuk bisa melancarkan akses itu. Itu foto sidang WTO. Ini kita nggak karena pada sidang kita nggak bisa ambil foto. Ini foto yang dari publikasi WTO karena. Tapi beginilah situasi sidang di WTO. Benar-benar serius, benar-benar menarik dan semuanya itu lawyer-lawyer uh, ekonomis yang bisa mengungkapkan uh, pendapatnya, opininya untuk membela negaranya masing-masing. Nah, foto yang terakhir ini adalah foto ketika saya di sorry sebelumnya. Yang di ketiga ini ketika di Brussels. Bayangin ya, sekarang tuh lihat ya. Di sebelah kiri itu Uni Eropa cuma dua biji loh orangnya. Cuma dua orang. Sekarang itu cuma satu orang malah. Lihat di situ, itu ada sekitar enam orang. Indonesia enam orang, lawan Uni Eropa dua orang. Begitu pentingnya kita butuh teman-teman untuk menguatkan international trade law. Bayangin, ini gap, gap knowledge-nya itu jauh banget. Gap skill-nya itu jauh banget. Dua lawan enam. Dan itu itu senior-senior saya semua itu ya ada Bu Pratnya waktu itu, ada Bu Erna segala macam yang yang sudah prominent udah senior uh, di di Kementerian Perdagangan. Itu pun kita berenam melawan dua orang itu yang botak itu namanya BC masih muda itu di sempat jadi atas atas Uni Eropa di Korea Selatan. Masih muda. Dan itu jabatannya cuma staf melawan satu orang direktur, satu orang kepala Kadi, satu orang kepala KPPI. Gap-nya itu besar, teman-teman. Indonesia dengan negara mitra kita. Makanya kita butuh teman-teman, ayo kita sama-sama mengamankan akses pasar Indonesia. Ayo teman-teman aktif terlibat di international trade law, menguatkan uh, pemerintah, bukan juga menguatkan Pak Joseph juga, nanti di, jadi lawyer. Bisa, karena kita butuh seperti ini. gitu. Karena semakin banyak lawyer, semakin murah harganya. Ya, ya. Hukum, hukum demand, 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 Pak. Jadi, 
Jadi itu teman-teman. Jadi kalau teman-teman masih bingung sekarang, apa sih sebenarnya internasional travel law itu? Ini potensi yang akan dapat teman-teman dapatkan. You can be anything, you can be anywhere dengan dengan, dengan kamu bisa spesif, uh, spesialisasi di internasional travel law. Lanjut. Nah ini kondisi saat ini adalah masih sedikitnya lawyer di Indonesia. Masih dihitung nggak nyampe lima ya Pak Pak Josep yang nggak nyampe lima ya lawyer ya untuk yang international trade law spesialisasi di international trade law nggak nyampe lima bayangin. Terus eh, dan juga buat teman-teman yang mungkin berminat kami membuka kesempatan untuk melakukan magang di Direktorat Pengamanan Perdagangan. Mungkin ada kasus-kasus yang teman-teman menarik yang sudah selesai ya kita catatan sudah selesai kita bisa bantu kita karena KPK atau untuk memungkin tesis mungkin teman-teman yang di di virtual lagi S2 atau teman-teman doktoral juga mungkin yang mau ini bisa kita 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 provide karena kita sumbernya A1. Iya <laughs> kan? Kita sumbernya A1 kalau ini ya. Karena teoritis itu bisa teman-teman bisa melihat langsung ini loh dinamika pemerintah membela uh, ekspor uh, kita ke luar negeri. Ini loh dinamika international trade law. Ini loh dinamika Indonesia berkecimpung di kancah perdagangan internasional. Mungkin itu saja dari saya. Um, kurang lebihnya kami saya minta maaf dan kita lanjutkan dan sesi diskusi. Oke, okay, terima kasih. Pas buat Pak Tanggo. Oke, okay, uh, now we are moving to Q&A sessions. I would like to invite student uh, here and also for the student that participating by using Zoom, you may raise your hand or you may use a chat to everyone to deliver your questions and please mention to whom the question is uh, intended to and Uh, we will begin perhaps from uh, Zoom meeting first. Okay, anyone who want to ask the question? If you want to be a traveler, you may ask the question to Patongo or Babaji, uh, or you want to be poster, or you want to be the rich man, you may ask the question to Patongset. Okay, this is anyone in the Zoom meeting who will ask the question? Please will raise your hand or you may chat. Or uh, seven, uh, perhaps uh, a brother, can you help me to open the chat? Oh, I think this is not a question. This is just. Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, anyone here want to ask the question? Okay. Uh, Oke, okay, Pak please give the speaker. Don't forget to mention your name, your class, and to whom the question ah, is. Baik, okay. sebelumnya saya izin bertanya apakah menggunakan bahasa Indonesia apa harus menggunakan Inggris, Pak? No, no, you. Terserah. Bagus. Wow. If you may be so happy, you can meet you in time. Baik. Uh, mungkin karena pertanyaan saya terkait dengan damping di Indonesia, saya ingin bertanya ke Pak Tompu dan Bu Prita menggunakan bahasa Indonesia. Sebelumnya terima kasih, Bapak Bu, uh, Pak Tompu dan Bu Prita. Bu Fuji, Bu Fuji, maaf uh, atas pemaparan yang sangat komprehensif. Uh, saya masih Joshua dari kelas perdagangan internasional B dan saya ingin bertanya tentang terkait uh, mungkin yang pertama damping dulu. Uh, terkait damping Ibu uh, dan Bapak, apakah damping itu sama dengan konsep predator, eh, apakah hal yang sama damping dengan predator pricing yang ada di UU uh, perlindungan maaf, persaingan bisnis? Karena uh, seperti yang saya baca itu konsepnya sama, tapi pertanyaan saya apakah kedua hal tersebut merupakan hal yang berbeda, apa hal yang sama. Dan yang kedua terkait dengan kasus kenaikan harga BBM disusul dengan harga perusahaan Vivo, itu perusahaan Belanda yang saya baca di literatur, itu tidak naik, tidak ikut naik dan tentunya harga itu di bawah harga pasarnya. Pertanyaan saya apakah praktik tersebut termaksud praktik dumping yang dilakukan oleh perusahaan Vivo dan praktik anti-dumping yang dilakukan oleh pemerintah Indonesia karena pemerintah Indonesia menghimbau Vivo untuk menaikkan harganya di atas harga pasar. Terima kasih sebelumnya. Baik, terima kasih. Ada pertanyaan, mungkin? Pak Yogi? Oke, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Kianu Zafa. Uh, saya dari hukum apa mahasiswa murid International Trade Law kelas A. Uh, I I appreciate uh, answer from anyone actually. Uh, what I want to ask is like Mr. Gustav said, the dumping isn't necessarily bad 
because when there's no one selling a certain commodity, uh, a dumping is actually a good thing. But what if uh, on a certain uh, circumstances, uh, government decided that they finally can sell their own products as the same product as the company sells? Uh, what powers does the company have to defend themselves when the government suddenly impose an anti-dumping policy to them because they're suddenly a domestic product on sale? And where they can challenge the policy, do they go to the court from the country that imposed the policy or straight to the international court? And what outcomes does the possibly happen if the court said that the government that imposed the policy is actually on the wrong? Does the company still be able to continue to sell their products, sell their products, or the government that imposed the policy will get a penalty from the, let's say, WTO? Thank you. Wow, such a technical question. Perhaps, uh, Gustav, you may respond to the second question first. You mean I'll I'll take oh, it and it goes yeah, along because yeah. there are so many questions yeah, in yeah. that one. Okay, let's let's start with a situation where um product was imported, whether it's dumped or not, and then you want to start up a, a new industry in Indonesia. In one of the companies that I work with, um we've developed um call it a statistical analysis program, which we get direct access to um, literally transaction by transaction imports from customs. It's very nice. I know you would love it. And one of the things that we do is we look at products where the imports are increasing and especially prices are decreasing at the same time, because that gives you an indication as to maybe dumping is taking place. And if there is an industry, then of course, we would go to that industry and say, well, it looks as though there might be dumping. Can we assist you? Can we bring a case on your behalf? But as an industry, what you would do is you would look at those same figures. You'd see, oh, we have 20 billion rupees of imports in a year. Um, well, there's nobody manufacturing it. Maybe I should start producing it because if I can sell half of that, I could start building a decent industry. So. You can have a look at the import statistics, decide, is there a market for a product? You look around, you see nobody else produces it here, and you can then decide to start um, building an industry. But what you then find is that dumping takes place, and you can't actually enter that market. Now, there is a provision under Article 3, well, technically under footnote 9 to Article 3 of the agreement, that says that you can determine injury in three ways. You have present injury, you have a threat of injury, which means if I don't do something now, there will be injury shortly. But then we have a provision which is not widely used, and we've only had one WTO dispute on that, and that is material retardation of the establishment of an industry, which means you can say that because of dumping, I cannot establish my industry. And the panel that ruled on that, that was the Morocco Hot Roll Steel's case, specifically said that there are two things that you have to look at. First of all, is it a new industry? So if you take an existing product and you just tweak it slightly, that's not a new industry. So for instance, let's take a, a memory stick. You have a memory stick with a capacity of 64 gigabytes. Now you produce one which is 128 gigabytes. It's still a memory stick. There, there might be some... Um, circuitry in, on the inside that's different, but it's not really a new product. But let's say you you always produce memory sticks, and now you start producing these, what do you call the flat ones, the, flat, the flash disks. Um, yes, it does the same job, but it is a completely different product. It's used in a different product. It's used in a camera, which you won't use a memory stick in, etc. So that might be, it's still the electronic industry, but it's a completely new product. You make a substantial investment in that after you've conducted your um, environmental studies and all those type of thing, impact assessments, the works, and you actually start to build your factory or you start production, but now you can't do, go any further because of the dumping. Then you can bring a case on the basis of material retardation. And you can then, even though you may not have a situation where you've actually had any sales, you can still impose an anti-dumping duty. It's not something that's often used. India is the biggest user, but they have 10, 15 cases on that. So out of 
more than a thousand cases that they've conducted. Um, Morocco obviously has used it. They've been challenged and found to be not compliant. Um, we've used it once. We were fortunate not to be challenged because it, the application was completely wrong. And I think the US has used it twice. I don't know about other countries, but there would be some examples here and there. If you go to court, the, the big question is what type of court do you have? And that varies very significantly by country. Now, the anti-dumping agreement, but not the subsidies agreement nor the safeguards agreement, requires that you must have an independent court or tribunal or administrative procedures to review decisions of the local authorities. So there is that requirement, but for some reason, only in the anti-dumping agreement. In some countries, you have specialized trade courts. You have a trade court in the US, you have a trade, essentially a trade court in the EU. In other countries, it's just normal court. So you go to the Supreme Court. In, oh, it's now nine years ago, 2013, there was a book published on judicial review on trade remedies. And at the same time, there was in the Journal of World Trade, a whole series of articles, 11 of them, on judicial review of anti-dumping specifically. And essentially, and, and this is a very big problem, and again, this is where lawyers have to come in. What was found is that judges don't understand. So for instance, in South Africa, if we have judicial review of anti-dumping and there's anything relating to administrative procedures, the judge seizes on that because they know administrative law. But the moment that you start arguing the facts of the case, the calculations, the substantive issues, the judge tries to steer away from that. So of all of the judicial reviews we've had, we've had one case where a judge actually addressed the substantive issues. Otherwise, they just try and skirt the issues because they, they simply don't understand. Now, for instance, in terms of our legislation, we can appoint or a judge can appoint an assessor to assist in interpreting the information but the problem is that judges are very proud people. So they don't like to acknowledge that they don't understand, so they don't appoint an assessor, and then they make mistakes. So, and, and that's unfortunately common around the world as well. For you as a lawyer, if you go to court, and I'll get to the issue as to whether you go to court or to the WTO, you have to be able to present something in such a way that the judge can actually understand. So I can give you anti-dumping calculations, which I think nobody in this room will understand, except maybe our colleagues from DPP. I can show you calculations or formulae on the determination of injury, which I won't understand, because it is such complicated economic calculations. So to try and explain that to a judge, um, it's a pity I, I, I don't have it here. We could have put it on the screen. How to calculate the value of a subsidy in the form of grant where it has value over a period of time. So for instance, government gives you a grant so that you can build a factory and the factory will be able to build for the next 10 years. Then there are ways in which you would allocate the costs over each year, et cetera. And when I looked at that formula the first time, I think I, I struggled with it for about five or six hours, trying different scenarios, different figures, et cetera, to try and understand how it worked. Now, when I take that same formula and I teach it to governments, I have a whole 10 step program set out over two PowerPoint slides. And I tell them, what you do is there's a formula and everybody goes, <gasps> you say, Step one, you do this. Step two, step three, step four, step five. And you take them literally through 10 steps. And the very first time I did that was with the government of Mauritius. And then I gave them an exercise. And five minutes later, every single person in the class had the right answer. So how do you explain to a judge? Step one, step two, step three. It sounds stupid, but judges don't understand economics. Or very few judges do. So if you go to court, that is the one thing that you have to bear in mind. If you can argue procedural issues, you have a good chance. If you argue substantive issues, you will have to very, very carefully explain things. 
How do you decide whether you go to court or to the WTO? You don't decide. The government does. Because you don't have local standing at the WTO. Only the governments have that. So what you have to do if a company in Indonesia um, is unsatisfied with the result that they got, they would have to come and speak to DPP. And then they will explain the process exactly how it works. But the government of Indonesia will have to then take a decision whether to go or not. Now, the problem is that not all companies in the industry may have the same interest. So, for instance, we represented cement exporters from Pakistan. I know you don't like that because Pakistan is doing cement against you. Um, but anyway, so one of our clients got a relatively low duty. I think it was 8 or 9%. And the others got 20 and 30 and 40%. And there were significant problems in the investigation. Pakistan actually challenged the preliminary decision in the WHO. It didn't go beyond consultations. And then the final decision, when government decide, had to decide whether to challenge or not, the biggest company, Lucky Cement, with the lowest duty, told government, no, we don't want to go to the WHO. Because what it thought would happen is the higher duties on its competitors would give it the market in South Africa because 10% duties, they were still more than 10% below the South African price. So no dispute. What happened? Oh, China took the market because there are no duties against China. So now they're stuck. So if they had decided at that stage to challenge it, in all likelihood, the decision would have been to withdraw the duties because the decision would have been adverse against South Africa. They made many mistakes in that investigation, and there would have been no duties against Pakistan. So you also have to look at what the industry wants. DPP is not going to say that, oh, we're going to challenge this measure if it's not something that the industry wants. They're not necessarily going to challenge it if the industry wants that, because there are obviously other things at play as well. Politics does do play a role. Um, again, they can give you more information on that. One of the issues that you have to consider is if you want to take a case to court in the United States, how much money have you got? Because it's going to cost you a lot of money. If you go to the WTO, technically it doesn't cost you anything because government has to pay for that. Although you do find that in some countries, and I'm not sure what the situation is here, industry often makes a contribution. For instance, Bangladesh was the first LDC that declared a dispute and that was against India. But they said, they told the industry, we cannot declare a dispute. We don't have the expertise. We don't have the money. We can't pay people, et cetera. And the company said, we'll pay. So that does happen. Um, Size on the question, but based on your experience and also in Indonesia perspective. Yeah, mungkin, uh perlu diklarifikasi sedikit ya untuk apa uh, pertanyaannya ya Pak ya. Please allow me saya, uh, Gustav. Jadi ada beberapa sokot pihak berkepentingan, interested parties in anti-dumping investigation maupun imposition ya. Itu perlu diklirkan. Satu nih eksportir yang melakukan dumping. Ya kan? Kedua tuh importir yang mengimport barang dumping. Ya. Ada juga pengguna barang damping, ada juga produsen barang yang dituduh damping, ya kan? Jadi ini importir bisa perusahaan Indonesia, pengguna bisa perusahaan Indonesia, produsen bisa perusahaan Indonesia, tapi eksportir ya kemungkinan besar itu adalah perusahaan di luar. Nah, kalau pertanyaan kamu tadi ya, ketika pemerintah mengenakan anti damping terhadap suatu barang ya yang keberatan ini siapa? Biasanya yang keberatan itu adalah importir, eksportir dan pengguna. Kalau produsen happy lah. Iya kan? Karena dia tidak harus berkompetisi dengan barang yang sangat murah. Sehingga dia bisa menaikkan harga. Ya, jarang kita melihat ada di beberapa kasus dia itu opos kalau memang dia itu dua kaki. Trader juga, produsen juga. Atau trader yang ngaku-ngaku produsen. Ya kan? Nah, kalau kayak begitu setelah 
anti dumpingnya ini sudah diimpose, say semua requirement tadi Gustav udah jelaskan mengenai kalau nggak ada ada material retardation dan seterusnya dan seterusnya. Biasanya itu meskipun penyelidikan yang diinisiasi oleh pemerintah sendiri, kita sudah ada beberapa kasus, ya. Itu dia itu harus membuktikan kan keberadaan kerugian. Harus ada industrinya dulu. Sebagian besar 90% lebih itu berdasarkan aplikasi atau petisi dari industri di dalam negeri yang merasa terugikan akibat dari barang import yang masuk. Eh ini barang import murah banget nih, harga bahan baku gue aja nggak nyampe nih segini nih. Gimana gue mau jualan, gue kalau tiap kali mau jualan pasti gue harus jual rugi nih. Tolong dong Kadi investigasi, tolong dong KPP investigasi. Ketika dikenakan ya mereka pasti senang. Nah, kalau tadi kamu nanya gimana caranya mau bawa ke WTO atau mau bawa ke pengadilan, tergantung siapanya. Kalau kamu represent eksportir, ya bisa nggak sekarang dia bawa ke pengadilan Indonesia? Untungnya bagaimana plus minusnya. Atau dia harus meyakinkan pemerintahnya dia untuk membawa Indonesia ke WTO. Nah, tapi kalau importir dan pengguna, masa kita menggugat pemerintah sendiri di DWTO? Kan nggak mungkin. Ya kan? Jadi venue-nya itu, kalau memang itu kemungkinan either dia ngompor-ngomporin perusahaan peng, apa pemerintah eksportir atau dia bawa ke court. Nah, permasalahan yang kedua sekarang court-nya yang mana? Ya kan? Coba kamu baca, kamu kan international trade law, lihat dasar hukumnya itu kan PP 34. Ya kan? PP 34 2011. Kamu lihat pasal 99. Di dalam pasal 99 dibilang bahwa kalau ada masalah mengenai pengenaan itu harus dibawa ke WTO. Kita bisa diskusi panjang lah, ini konsisten nggak dengan tadi yang Gustav bilang, ini itu, ini itu. Kita sebagai lawyer juga kreatif kok. Ya, beberapa kali kita juga beberapa kali ada kasus bukan saya ya. Ada kasus yang membawa ini baik ke Petun kah, PMH kah, ya, mau ke Judicial Review under MA kah? mau ke pengadilan pajak kah? Memang nggak ada satu court yang spesial karena ya 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 belum ada. Ya. Coba bayangin suruh ke pengadilan negeri, ya kan? Suruh kalau tadi yang si Gustaf bilang, "Oh, ada kalkulasi salah nih, PCN-nya salah ngitung kosong production begini ya dia AO AO aja." Paling-paling yang kalau misalnya petun, "Oh, apakah ini melewati jangka waktu enggak?" Ya, apakah ini enggak? Nah, kan itu itu yang tadi Gustaf bilang, nggak cuma di Indonesia lo nggak perlu kita ketawa di semua negara pun nggak ada hakim yang memang mengerti secara substansi hal-hal seperti ini. Jadi kamu hitung-hitungan kalau misalnya kamu jadi pengacara lawyer ya, ya kalau kita bawa ke pengadilan lokal kira-kira menang nggak ya? Kan pertimbangannya itu. Kalaupun menang, efeknya apa? Apakah PMK-nya itu bisa dicabut dengan 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 keputusan PMH atau kamu ngincer ganti rugi, kamu ngincer denda? Kalau kamu ngincer pencabutan ya kamu harus ke petun. Ya dong. Inilah kreativitas yang tadi Tonggo bilang. Ya nggak semuanya pun hitam putih, letterlock semuanya udah bagus, udah rapi. Kita sekarang PP34 pun lagi udah lagi mau direvisi kok udah 10 tahun lebih nggak kelar-kelar itu revisinya. Tanya aja Tonggo bagaimana ininya. Developmentnya, ya kan? Nah, tapi kalau dibawa ke WTO tadi ya, kalau tadi umpama kita yang ekspor ke luar negeri, ya kan? Terus kita digitu-gituin di lah di, di luar negeri sering loh kita kita enam kasus kita bawa negara bukan yang ece ece kita bawa EU kita bawa US kita bawa South Africa Australia ya ke WTO Amerika kita bawa ya bukan yang kaleng kaleng ya kan nah kita ketika kita bawa di situ ya pasti nggak cuman government kan government nggak tiba-tiba wah nih gue lagi baca nih tiba-tiba ada or, ada order baru dari pemerintah Amerika nih kayaknya nih nggak 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 bener nih udah deh gue initiate case deh pasti kan harus ada kompornya kompornya itu siapa ya pasti ya perusahaan kita yang mengekspor ke negara itu yang dikenakan anti dumping dia datang ke Patongo Patongo 
gimana nih saya nih sekarang nggak bisa ekspor lagi nih ke Amerika nih. Ketika kalau saya diekspor ke Amerika, saya kena nanti dumping duties 20 persen. Boro-boro cuannya 20 persen. Ya kan? Padahal pasar kita gede nih di situ nih. Ya ini bisa, ini neraca perdagangan lah, inilah, itulah. Ya kan? Baru nanti Pak Tonggo naik, panatan. Panatan naik ke Dirjen, naik Dirjen ke Menteri. Ya Menteri baru nanti putusin oke. Okay, Indonesia maju nih ke WTO. Oke, okay, kita kontak PTRI Jenewa. Ya, kita kontak PTRI Jenewa, kita minta dubesnya, nanti kita submit request for consultation dulu, request panel request baru kita jalan panel proceeding. Step-stepnya kayak begitu. Enggak mungkin pemerintah itu out of the blue tiba-tiba juga men-challenge pemerintah lain itu enggak ada, pasti ada kompornya di belakang. Kalau enggak ada interest mau ngapain? Emang berlitigasi di WTO juga Ya emang sih gratis, nggak nggak ada biaya uang perkara atau apa seperti Gustaf bilang. Tetapi toh kan harus bayar lawyer, ya kan harus travel bulak balik, harus hearing, harus ini, harus itu, ya kan. Nah itulah yang yang biasanya makanya tadi saya klarifikasi dulu dari pertanyaan kamu ya siapa yang menggugat, siapa yang dirugikan, forumnya kemana tergantung, tergantung kamu membela siapa. Kira-kira gitu. Terima kasih. Uh, komprehensif selanjutnya uh, mungkin bisa ke Bu Fuji dan Pak Tonggo mungkin bisa sekaligus merespon pertanyaan yang pertama juga, silahkan Bu Fuji ya, terima kasih Pak Mursal saya dan Pak Tonggo akan coba merespon pertanyaan yang pertama ya e, terkait predatory pricing dan anti dumping jadi mungkin saya jelasin dulu ya e, anti dumping itu penyelidikannya Um, uh, melibatkan perbandingan harga jadi damping itu sebenarnya kan tidak dilarang secara gamblang ya sebenarnya damping itu boleh nggak dilarang oleh peraturan internasional yang dilarang itu kalau dampingnya menyebabkan kerugian terhadap industri yang memproduksi produk yang serupa dan ada hubungan sebab akibat antara praktik damping tersebut dan juga kerugian yang terjadi. Jadi kalau nggak ada kerugian yang terjadi di industri yang serupa, damping nggak masalah dong. Justru malah mungkin lebih bagus karena pengguna produk itu bisa menggunakan uh, produk itu dengan harga yang lebih murah. Oh nggak ada juga yang dirugikan karena nggak ada juga produsen yang menggunakan yang memproduksi produsen yang serupa, produk yang serupa. Namun ketika ada industri dalam negeri yang memproduksi produk tersebut, barulah. Uh, ada timbul uh, penyelidikan anti dumping. Nah, di mana nanti uh, otoritas investigasi itu akan membandingkan uh, harga harga uh, produk uh, ya, ketika diekspor ke negara tujuan ekspor dan juga ketika harganya produk itu dijual di dalam negeri. Ketika harganya dijual di har uh, negara tujuan ekspor dengan harga yang lebih murah dibandingkan yang dia jual di dalam negeri, barulah uh, muncul adanya dumping. Dan itu praktiknya dilakukan oleh perusahaan, bukan tadi kan uh, ada sebut-sebut mengenai BBM ya uh, pemerintah itu uh, kalau damping ya uh, sebagian besar emang kalau nggak salah semuanya juga praktiknya dilakukan oleh perusahaan dan bukan dari praktik government kecuali penyelidikan anti subsidi baru emang kebijakan-kebijakannya kebijakan dari pemerintah. Uh, itu sih mungkin Pak Tonggo bisa tambahkan. Oke, okay, mungkin sedikit nambahin ya. Uh, kalau kita bicara predatory pricing dan dumping, kelihatannya mirip ya kan? Kelihatannya mirip. Cuma kita bandingkan ada, saya bandingkan saya gini lah. Kita ada sebenarnya ada tiga skenario yang mungkin terjadi. Pertama, tidak ada dumping, tapi dia predatory pricing. Contoh, misalnya gini, saya jual di Indonesia itu 10. Saya jual di Malaysia itu 12. Tidak ada damping. Tapi harga dua jual di 12 itu itu bisa jadi predatory pricing di Malaysia ketika harga industri yang sama di Malaysia itu 20 misalnya. Predatory pricing bisa. Ya kan? Atau skenario kedua. Ada damping tapi tidak predatory pricing. Contoh saya jual di Indonesia 10, saya jual di Malaysia 8. Tapi harga produk dalam negerinya Malaysia jual 6. Predator pricing enggak? Enggak. Atau skenario yang ketiga, saya damping dan saya juga predatory pricing. 
Jadi ada tiga skenario. Nah, rezimnya berbeda. Kalau kita bicara predatory pricing, kita bicara hukum nasional yang berbicara tentang competition. Makanya kalau kalian membandingkan dengan EU, sesama negara EU itu tidak akan mengenakan instrumen trade remedies. Among EU members, there's no such thing as dumping. They use competition law. Kenapa? Karena competition at some point, saya nggak bicara semuanya ya, at some point bisa jadi lebih mudah untuk dikenakan. Persis saya Pak Joseph ya, at some point. Gitu. Tetapi, kalau kita bicara dumping, perbandingannya bukan membandingkan barang impor, harga barang impor dengan harga domis, harga barang domestik sejenis, bukan. Tapi harga barang impor dengan harga asli barang impor tersebut di negara asalnya. Jadi completely different regime. Ya, nah uh, kembali lagi. Kalau misalnya tadi kasusnya Vivo ya, Vivo. Nah itu kalau misalnya predatory pricing kah, atau segala macam, kembali lagi kita harus melihat Vivo. Kalau misalnya kita bilang itu itu predator pricing atau tidak, itu nanti ranahnya KPP akan menyelidiki benar nggak predatory pricing atau tidak. Tetapi setahu saya. Semuanya itu kan nanti regulatornya adalah PSDM, Menteri SDM ya. Kalau kita bicara khusus spesifik tentang BBM Vivo. Lalu, yang kedua, itu nanti ranahnya KPP. Tapi apakah itu damping atau tidak? Kita lihat lagi, si Vivo ini ngejual harganya, produk spesifik yang sama dengan yang dia jual di Indonesia, itu lebih rendah nggak harganya dibandingkan yang ada di uh, negara asalnya Vivo misalnya. Kalau ternyata harganya ternyata lebih tinggi di Indonesia, ya nggak ada dumping. Tapi kalaupun ada dumping, sekali lagi ada trifecta untuk dumping. Ada kerugian nggak buat industri dalam negeri kita? Dan yang unsur yang ketiga, ada kausali nggak? Ada sebab akibat nggak? Antara adanya praktek dumping, kerugian, ini harus ada sebab akibat. Kita nggak bisa bilang, nih, dumping, terus langsung kita kenakan BMAD, misalnya gitu. BMAD masuk anti dumping ya. Kalau misalnya tidak ada, Trifecta ini tidak ada tiga unsur ini karena agreement jelas-jelas mengatakan harus terbukti tiga adanya dumping, adanya kerugian di industri domestik dan adanya hubungan sebab akibat kasualing. Salah satu tidak terbukti penyelidikan bisa digugat itu. Nah, kalau kembali lagi kita bicara lagi, kalau kita bicara hukum kompetisi ya berarti kita nanti bicaranya di ranah hukum e, nasional kita misalnya kalau KPPU nanti membuktikan itu nanti KPPU. Kalau KPP digugat, mungkin ranahnya lewat gugatan di pengadilan misalnya, di pengadilan nasional kita. Intinya itu adalah juridisi nasional kita. Tetapi kalau kita bicara dumping, nah harus hati-hati karena dumping ini kita udah bicara internasional trade law. Kalau misalnya kita nanti misalnya menuduh itu dumping, dia punya punya kesempatan dan punya hak untuk bisa ikut dalam penyelidikan. Dan kalau misalnya penyelidikan kita salah atau segala macam, dia punya hak bukan perusahaan vivonya ya, tapi negara di mana perusahaan Vivo itu terdaftar berdiri, negara asalnya punya hak untuk menggugat Indonesia di ranah WTO. Jadi completely different regime, tapi at some point itu bisa bisa terjadi bersama. Ada tiga skenario yang tadi. Wah. Mau tambahin dikit. <laughs> Kalau di Indonesia sendiri, penyelidikan anti dumping itu kan dilakukan oleh investigasi otoritas investigasi ya kadi dan KPB tadi kan tapi nanti yang memutuskan kan ada namanya pertimbangan kepentingan nasional dan di tim pertimbangan kepentingan nasional ini salah satu e, lembaga yang terlibat adalah KPPU Komite Pengawasan Komisi ya Pengawasan Usaha ya jadi walaupun e, misalnya terbukti ada dumping tapi nanti ada tim pertimbangan kepentingan nasional yang termasuk di dalamnya adalah KPPU ikut dalam rapat tersebut. Dia juga akan menganalisis apakah ada indikasi monopoli, adanya persaingan usaha yang tidak sehat. Dan itu juga termasuk dalam analisis dari kementerian tim kepentingan pertimbangan kepentingan nasional tersebut sebelum memutuskan apakah untuk mengimpos kebijakan anti damping ini atau tidak. Oke, demikian. Terima kasih. Baik. Terima kasih uh, Pak Tonggo dan Bu Puji. Uh, um, we just received a question from the, our right side. We now we look for the question from our left side. Perhaps, is there any question? Yep. One more question perhaps? Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, hello, uh, 
uh, perkenalkan nama saya Riva Bagus dari kelas pendidikan internasional kelas E. First of all, uh, thank you very much for uh, all of the speakers for the explanation. Very interesting for me and insightful. Uh, is it needed for me to ask more than one question? First to Mr. Gustav and next to Mr. Joseph. <laughs> Okay. Uh, first, to Dr. Gustav, you have mentioned before that the country that applies the regulations about safeguard usually contraindicated with the anti dumping. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, what I want to ask is what is the basic things we need to understand about the correlation between uh, anti dumping, countervailing measures, and safeguard? And next to Mr. Joseph, Mr. Joseph uh, asked us about who wants to be international trade lawyers. Um, for me, actually, I'm not on a level on I want to be international trade lawyers for right now, but I'm really interested on becoming uh, international trade lawyers. And what I want to ask is what we have to do right now if we want to be an international trade lawyers. Thank you very much. Okay, so, so first of all, let's start with the correlation between anti-dumping and countervailing, um, because that's what you often find. It's, it's actually very seldom that you will find a countervailing case on its own. It's usually part of an anti-dumping investigation as well. So you have a lot of anti-dumping cases without countervailing. You have very few countervailing without anti-dumping. Let's look at a situation where the domestic price is 100, the export price is 80. But the reason why it's 80 is because the government gives an export subsidy of 20. Forget about the fact that it's technically a prohibited subsidy and so on, because it still happens. In a case like that, you have the option to either have anti-dumping or countervailing because it's the same thing. You can't have anti-dumping for 20 and countervailing for 20 because then you double counting. Your problem arises when you have an export price of 80 and a domestic price of 90, but there's a subsidy of 10. So the, domestic, the, the government subsidizes the cost of production in that country by 10. And on top of that, there's dumping as well. Let me give you a practical example. We had an investigation on cheese. Now in Ireland, at that time, let's say that um, you had, you paid the farmer 100 rupiah for a liter of milk. You need 10 liters of milk to make one kilogram of cheese. So that's already a thousand, excluding the other um, products, the rennet, the labor costs, etc. But in Ireland, the cheese was not selling at 1,000, it was already selling at 800. And then it was exported at 500. So you now have a situation where your domestic price decreases because of a subsidy. And you can't anti-dump that because there's no dumping on that part. But then on top of that, there's dumping as well. So in a case like that, you would have both an anti-dumping and a countervailing investigation at the same time. And you would have measures against both of them. Now you complicate it a little bit more with a safeguard. Let's go back to the lysine investigation. Let's assume that all other requirements for all measures have been met. So in anti-dumping, you had dumping, you had, you had injury, you had causal link. In safeguards, you had unforeseen developments and gut obligations that led to an increase in imports, and you had injury and a cause link. You may recall that what I told you was that the prices from China were about 650. The prices from other countries were significantly higher. So what you could have done is you could have had your safeguard of 27%, because that would have protected the domestic industry against fair trade. But that would still leave the unfair trade dumping 
from China. And then you could have had an anti-dumping duty of maybe another 30 or 40%, depending on what your findings were, that specifically applied to China, while the safeguard applied to everybody. <laughs> no, you're saying, but you said. Mai, kasih door prize, Mai, kasih door prize, Mai. Udah mau jadi internasional travel, enggak sih? Kita berbusa di sini, Mai. Oke. What will it takes? Ya, satu sih pasti hard skill lah. Ya, jadi you have to have the knowledge. Ya, international trade law is not all about trade remedies. Let's just mention. Ini Bible-nya nih. Mau dibakar, mau direbus, mau diminum, mau diapain, terserah. Yang penting ini nih. This is the the all the agreements of WTO here. Ya. Yeah. Anti-dumping subsidy safeguard is only three. Maybe, maybe this. Yeah. <laughs> yes. What I'm trying to say is there are still other Ya, yeah, ada speciality. Like tadi Puji cerita mengenai kita Indo, uh, mie sedap kita di 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 band di Singapura di Hong Kong. Ini sebut SPS. Ya, yeah, terkait dengan human health, public health. Ya, yeah. ketika kita jual barang terus di dilarang dengan alasan kesehatan. Ya, yeah. kadang-kadang kan ada yang benar, ada yang juga akal-akalan. Kita mesti cek, oh kenapa cuma Indonesia doang? Oh saya cek ada kok mie dari yang tempat lain, super mie dari tempat lain juga mengandung substance yang sama. Kenapa cuma Indonesia doang dilarang? Oh lu ada nggak standar internasionalnya yang melarang substance itu nggak boleh di dalam makanan? Oh kalau emang benar ada, loh kok lu ininya eh, mem membuat requirement-nya melebihi daripada apa internasional standar yang ada? Nah hal-hal kayak begini gitu loh. Ya, ini adalah bidang yang lainnya lagi yang which mungkin Gustav sama saya juga nggak ahli di bidang itu masih banyak banyak kita ngomong TBT, kita ngomong pre-shipment inspection, kita ngomong import licensing, kita ngomong IPR, kita ngomong trims, services, ya kan? Masih banyak opportunity, bukan hanya trade remedies. Nah, apa yang harus kali kamu miliki sebagai ya modal awal lah ya saya di awal lulus kuliah nol nggak ngerti nih begini beginian ya dulu dulunya hukum dagang profesor juga nggak pernah datang ya kan itu juga nggak tahu ya kan yang ngisi <laughs> namanya tuh bisa lulus ujiannya syukur dapat cek ya kan nggak pernah datang juga kalau kamu bisa ya, apalagi ada Bu Prita, ada apa segala semua ada Pak Mursal di sini ya dengan modul. Kalau kalian interest in trade remedies, oke, okay, ya kan. Kalau kalian interest di tempat lain ya mungkin kalian buat tesis di bidang itu, take one example atau kalian ikutin unpad, tolong dong ikut mood court WTO dong, jangan jesep doang. Aduh, ya kan. Kamu ikut di situ, ya kan. Kamu di fasilita itu yang saya tonggo, ya kan Fuji. Belajar banyak dari mood court loh. Karena kita dipaksa untuk, karena kasus-kasusnya itu biasanya menyangkut isu-isu yang the most recent. Dan kita nggak disuapin, kita harus do some research. Kalau lu berharap Pak Mursal yang ngajarin lu sampai lu jadi orang, jadi practitioner, practitioner international trade, nggak begitu. Kita hanya nggak bisa ngasih bekal nih loh. Kalau kamu mau nyari sini, kamu jalannya ke sini. Kalau kamu mau ke situ, kamu jalannya ke sono. Kalau sini, kamu lihatnya ini. Ya kan? At the end of the day, you have to learn yourself. Nggak ada yang ngajarin itu juga. Yang bisa kita bantu, palingnya tadi. Pak Tonggo udah dengan baik hati. ya Buka internship opportunity. ya Supaya kalian bisa ngeliat tuh live action-nya seperti apa sih. Ketika dispute, ketika investigasi, ketika ada masalah. Ya kan, sehingga kalian tuh nggak blank blank banget ketika nanti kalau belajar, oh ini toh, oh ini toh yang kemarin gua ngeliat ini, oh begini toh, itu jadi lebih menarik ya, ya nanti minta tolong Pak Tonggo untuk bisa internship di WTO, minta tolong Fuji bisa internship di PTRI Jenewa, ya kan, nah itu hal-hal yang yang kita eh, mungkin kita bisa bantu, tapi at the end of the day ya kamu yang harus itu. 
itu hard skill ya. Kalau soft skill juga penting ya. Sehingga kamu sekarang udah ada salah satu harus ada keberanian, harus PD. Lawyer di manapun lah, nggak cuma international trade ya. Kalian harus belajar public speaking, kalian harus belajar bagaimana mempresentasikan, doing research ya kan, menyelesaikan masalah karena satu problem itu tadi contohnya kamu harus mengadvise government kenapa government harus maju ke WTO daripada ini diselesaikan di local court. Ya kan? Untungnya apa sih buat government? Kan kalian yang nanti harus meyakinkan ketika buat submisi ke investigating authority di pihak lain, ya kalian yang harus meyakinkan bahwa mereka itu salah. Ya kan? Nah, itu apa? Ya selain knowledge tadi hard skill ya, kalian harus gimana? Kadang-kadang orang pintar di kepala tapi nggak bisa mengutarakan, nggak bisa menulis, nggak bisa apa, ya cilaka juga. Ya kan? Jadi harus ada kombinasi lah. Ya kan? Nah, dua itu kalau kamu bisa punya hard skill, kamu punya soft skill, kamu dibantu, dikasih, dibukain pintu-pintu nih loh. Makanya dekat-dekat jangan jauh-jauh nih sama dosen-dosen kalian yang punya koneksi ke mana-mana. Ya kan, kamu bisa dibantu, dikasih pengalaman. Ya udah setelah itu ya kamu jalan sendiri. It's your own destiny. Saya kira itu Pak. Oke, okay. sangat inspiratif. Um, I just want to want to add to emphasize this. Okay, just, the, the, the one thing that you also have to consider is, I mean, we working with trade remedies. Three of the agreements. This is not international trade law. This is a part of international trade law. So your opportunities as an international trade lawyer, obviously, if you want to work with Joseph, you'll have to be trade remedies, mostly. But it's much wider. If you look at things such as international investment law, that's international trade law. And that's a big issue. And there are lots of disputes. You go to the ICSID, for instance. Um, if you look at um, what in the WGO would be trips, your intellectual property rights. More money investment. <laughs> much, much, much more. Much, 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 more. Much, much more. Much more. And, and the thing is, <laughs> we, we have the TRIPS agreement, intellectual property. But what is the TRIPS agreement about? It's about implementing agreements that are already there. So you have the burn convention you have the oslo convention you have you have you have etc so there are a lot of other conventions that come in and where you have a lot of work which does not necessarily fall under the who you have a lot of free trade agreements it's not governed by the who other than article 24 of gat which says how you have to form um, an fda what the requirements are but once you've entered into an fda it is governed by the fda itself And you may find that even as far as trade remedies are concerned, and especially as far as safeguards are concerned, you have FTA safeguards, which were completely different to what we have yeah. explained today, a global safeguard. So you have to consider that, yes, trade remedies may account for more than 50% of all disputes in the WTO. So maybe there's a little bit more work there as a lawyer than on some of the other agreements. So if you're going to become a specialist on rules of origin, yep. your chances of getting to a WTO panel would be relatively slim. But don't look only at trade remedies. Don't look only at the WTO because international trade law is much wider than that. Totally agree, Gustav. Okay. But I want to add some emphasis, please. Nambahin buat tadi ya. Tadi kami juga diskusi dengan Pak Joseph sebelum ke sini, terus juga dengan Pak Mursal. Kita kalau tertarik dengan international trade law kan selama ini kan umpat tuh banyak tuh mood court-nya tapi nggak pernah ikutan mood court dan Jackson ya. Iya. Ya. Ini pengalaman saya saya pernah ikut waktu di Edinburgh itu. Uh, mood court dan Jackson itu kamu nanti bisa kalau kalian ikut nanti ya mudah-mudahan ada yang mau ikut dan mudah-mudahan disponsori oleh akademi ya umpat ya karena cukup mahal ya. <laughs> tapi gini, mesti tuh kalian bisa melihat bagaimana mahasiswa-mahasiswa hukum di seluruh di banyak negara berkreativitas membangun argumen hukum, membangun argumen pembelaan karena nanti mekanismenya itu kalian akan satu jadi penggugat, satu jadi tergugat, dua kali, dua kali sidang. Dan nanti eh, kalau kalian lulus dari regional bisa final nanti disponsori untuk datang ke Geneva di markasnya WTO langsung. 
tapi bukan soal jalan-jalannya yang saya mau tekankan adalah di situ kalau kalian aktif terlibat itu akan sangat menarik karena seperti kata Gustav tadi di situ kalian akan ramu bukan hanya dari buku ungu ini bukan hanya dari buku ini tapi juga bisa kalian ramu dari Vienna Convention dari 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 Arsiwa, kalau bahasanya sekarang Arsiwa ya, kalau dulu kan International Law Commission on and Draft Text and so on. Tapi di, di situ kan juga bisa banyak belajar bagaimana kreativitas teman-teman kalian nanti gitu loh yang dari dan itu bisa jadi networking kalian bukan membangun kalian pemahaman kalian lebih cepat untuk mengerti mengenai trade law gitu. Loh. Jadi apa yang didapat di kelas itu mungkin tidak tidak sepenuhnya bisa tercermin di dunia nyata karena yang di, di dunia itu jauh lebih kompleks bukan hanya buku ini saja tapi banyak 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 penafsiran banyak banyak hukum banyak banyak kon, kon, uh, customer law yang bisa digunakan gitu loh saya, saya kalau bisa kalian bisa ini dan ada kesempatan ikut John Jackson Mood Court dan itu talent scouting mana tahu bisa kalian bukan kerja di ini di Pandelis biasanya Pandelis yang ininya yang uh, ininya jadi Nah, jadi ini promotor utamanya mempromotornya. Jadi intinya teman-teman banyak kesempatan bisa magang di DPP, bisa nggak tahu pak, jasa magang nggak di jasa <laughs> ya. Tapi banyak kesempatan teman-teman untuk ini karena internasional trade law itu sangat-sangat menarik. Tidak hanya buku ungu itu, tapi juga banyak sekali aspek hukum internasional. Karena itu big, um, a mix of public international law and private international. izin Pak Murso. <laughs> Teman-teman pasti tahu ya tadi kan sudah diperkenalkan oleh Pak Murso juga background saya sebenarnya akuntansi. Tapi kemudian saya apply Kementerian Perdagangan, kebetulan dapatnya di Direktorat Pengamanan Perdagangan yang notabene adalah lawyernya pem, lawyernya pemerintah. Jadi jauh banget ya antara akuntansi dengan menjadi lawyer, tapi seiring berjalannya waktu saya Uh, dikasih ini sih uh, teman-teman bisa download ya di websitenya WTO itu lengkap banget ada modul-modul terkait dengan agreement-agreement yang ada di WTO itu benar-benar bisa dipelajari oleh pemula-pemula karena memang dasar jadi kalau teman-teman tertarik mengenai international trade law ini seperti saya juga waktu pertama kali masuk Kementerian Perdagangan saya baca sendiri uh, uh, modul-modul yang ada di website WTO terus ada juga Uh, teksnya nanti untuk mengecek uh, pemahaman teman-teman terkait isu tersebut. Nah, di akhir dari uh, modul tersebut, nanti teman-teman bisa dapat sertifikat bahkan ditandatangani langsung oleh DG WTO. Nah, sertifikat ini kan bisa teman-teman jadikan dasar ya, kalau misalnya teman-teman nanti apply pekerjaan, atau nanti misalnya mau apply uh, S2. Saya kebetulan juga waktu itu, karena saya akhirnya kan kerja di Kementerian Perdagangan dan di trade law, akhirnya saya ngambil S2-nya nggak akuntansi lagi. Saya ngambil S2-nya International Law and Economics, jadi both antara ekonomi dan juga uh, hukum. Di sana saya belajar semua agreement WTO ini, <laughs> sekilas-sekilas lah seminggu-seminggu. Jadi itu saya pakai tuh uh, sertifikat yang saya dapat waktu saya ikut online course-nya WTO. Jadi ya teman-teman sebagai permulaannya. Masnya ini udah semester berapa ya? Udah bisa magang dong ya? <laughs> Mungkin bisa... Di atasan lah. Iya, permulaannya sambil apply di DPP bisa juga sambil baca-baca dulu modul-modul, ngumpulin sertifikat supaya lebih daya jualnya lebih tinggi. Itu aja sih, terima kasih. Baik. Terima kasih, Bu Fuji. Okay, please, please give a boost for all the speakers for today uh, lecturers. Unfortunately, it's been three hours, Gustavo, <laughs> longer than we expected. Okay, uh, before we close this seminar, I would like to invite the speaker to give a closing statement, perhaps just one minute uh, for each uh, speaker, uh, beginning from the Gustav. Please, Gustav. One minute. What what can one say in one minute? <laughs> I think that, that the big thing for us is um, you're busy with international trade law as a course. And today we had, a, even though we went to three hours, we had a very brief discussion on what trade remedies are. And if we can interest, as Joseph said, even one or two or three of you in trade remedies in becoming experts in that, whether it's to work with somebody like him or against him or with DPP, CARDI, KPPI, um, then I think we've, we've already achieved our goals. If we, 
if we interested some of you to say that, oh, well, I was thinking of doing a master's. Maybe this is an interesting topic to do a master's. But I can tell you there are lots of topics within this area for PhDs as well. So there are lots of topics. So if you want to do further studies, et cetera, I mean, if you put and the whole team is here, we shall talk to them. Um, there are really lots of opportunities. Um, you can follow Fuji's route and go and do the mile in, in Bern. She will tell you all about that. Wonderful courses that are available internationally. But what we're also trying to do at this stage is we're developing a new module on trade remedies for UNPAD. This is the first module in what will hopefully become much more expansive. We will actually, and, and you don't even know that yet, Marshall, because we, it was a call that I got yesterday. Tomorrow, I'll be having meetings with a project with Arise again to discuss what other modules we can develop in future. So we're looking at dispute settlement, we're looking at SPS, DBT, and so on, so that there would be essentially a whole MH just on WGO law with various modules. And when Joseph referred earlier to 300 plus pages, that was just on trade remedies. And we would do something similar for the other courses as well. Yeah. Um, kalau dari saya sih, tadi ya uh, ada satu, dua, tiga orang aja yang berminat dan pada akhirnya melakukan fokus di bidang ini, kita sih udah happy ya. Saya udah umur lebih dari 40, Eri Bunjamin udah 50 lebih, udah mau 60, Gustav udah 60. Jadi re regenerasi itu penting ya, ya. Jadi sekali lagi apa yang bisa kita bantu ya kita akan bantu buka jalan seluas luasnya lah ya buat kalian ya karena kalian tuh generasi generasi penerus kita juga nggak mungkin mau kerja sampai umur berapa sih gua ya kan pasti kita harus buka jalan buat yang baru baru karena ya semakin hari tantangan kita itu semakin kompleks ya apalagi kalian mau kalian saya bilang mau idealisme membela negara semakin lama semakin kompleks nggak hanya dengan multilateral ada bilateral ada regional ada apa segala dan event yang multilateral aja kita lacking expert in that field gitu loh ya kan jadi kan seperti tadi Tonggo bilang kita have a long way to catch up makanya kita perlu banyak orang yang memang fokus spesialisasi di bidang ini tapi one thing mungkin yang bisa encourage kalian saya aja yang no saya nggak tahu Fuji atau Tonggo ya ketika kuliah itu eh, belajar masalah ini atau enggak tapi kalau kalian unpad udah ada program spesialisasi apalagi ada bantuan dari Rice ya kalian tuh punya head start dibanding kita kita generasi yang udah uzur ini kalau kalian nggak mau mengkapitalisasi itu you have to be better than us gitu loh kita aja yang di awal awal nggak atau apa apa nggak nggak belajar beginian aja sedikit banyak bisa meniti di bidang ini apalagi kalian yang sudah diberikan luxury dari kampus ya dengan pengajar-pengajar yang kompeten dengan modul-modul yang dibuat oleh expert-expert yang ada ya sekarang tinggal niat ada nggak niatnya kalau ada niat pasti bisa lah ya terima kasih kalau dari saya sih pendek aja ya, semoga dari sesi diskusi kita hari ini semakin banyak teman-teman yang memiliki ketertarikan di bidang international trade law, khususnya trade remedies. Jangan takut dulu ya, kayaknya kok tadi pembahasannya kayaknya ribet gitu, udah hampir hitung-hitungan, terus ada kerugian itu apa gitu. Semua bisa dipelajari, asal ada niat seperti kata Pak Joseph, pelan-pelan aja uh, seperti saya juga dulu benar-benar dari nol nggak ngerti apa-apa tapi akhirnya ter terjun di dunia ini dan menarik sekali bisa uh, ber bisa menjadi uh, bagian dari tim pemerintah Indonesia untuk membela kepentingan-kepentingan ekspor ekspor tir Indonesia yang mengalami hambatan di negara mitra dagang nah kalau teman-teman uh, nantinya ada yang tertarik uh, untuk bisa Uh, belajar lebih lanjut terkait retna medis, pengen uh, terjun langsung dengan magang di DPP, bisa menghubungi kami, saya dan Tonggo. Uh, uh, itu aja sih, semoga teman-teman jangan takut ya, jangan justru makin uh, menjauh dari trade law ini, justru kita harapannya pengen lebih banyak lagi generasi-generasi muda yang mempelajari isu ini. Demikian, terima kasih. Kalau dari saya, 
mungkin cuma ngutip lagunya Aladin ya. Jadi International Trade Law itu A Whole New World, A New Fantastic Point of View. Ya, jadi like dulu, saya dulu kuliah hukum perdagangan internasional, Prof. Wala, saya tidur dan dapat C. gitu. Ya, jadi ini kuala terus saya masuk bangkir, BRI, terus nyumplung di perdagangan ini. Tapi di sini saya sadar bahwa ya tadi dua 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 lirik Aladin tadi Whole New World dan Fantastic Fantastic Point of View. Jadi buat teman-teman kesempatan itu terbuka lebar sebenarnya. Silakan bergabung, silakan menjadi international trade lawyer seperti Pak Joseph, international trade expert seperti Gustav, bahkan mungkin bisa jadi mungkin salah satu dari teman-teman akan menjadi in orang Indonesia pertama bisa jadi panelis di WTO, bisa jadi. Kita tunggu itu. Terima kasih. Uh, finally, we come to the end of this seminar. I would like to thank once again to all the speakers, to Gustav, Bajose, Bufuji, and also Kantongo. And we look forward to seeing you in another seminar held by International the uh, Transnational Business Law Department. Once again, thank you, everyone. See you in the next session. Back to the MC. Uh, ada foto-foto nih kan. Sidangnya. Thank you very much, Mr. Mursa Malana, to, who has led the discussion for today. And uh, we will also like to thank the speakers today, Mr. Gustav, Mr. Uh, Cristiano, Mr. Joseph, and Mr. and Ms. Fuji. My apologies for the very insightful discussion, a very dis, uh, insight, insightful discussion indeed. And now, uh, next stop, continuing our agenda, we will have our head of transnational business law department will give a closing remarks. Oh, or should we take a picture first? Uh, should we take a picture first with the speakers? Okay, uh, who will lead the pictures? Thank you. Oh, photo. Can we uh, just move there and then we can take a picture with all the participants of the photographer to take a picture. Thank <laughs> you. 
Participants, um, with the photo session that we have just took, we are now officially closing our today's lecture, our today agenda. And we have come, we would like to express our biggest gratitude and appreciation to all of our speakers for the time and the knowledge. And I hope we'll meet again in other circumstances, in other lectures. And to Mr. Mujahidi for making your time to be here with us, to our moderator, Mr. Mursal Maulana, and all participants for your time and excitement to participate in the today's event. Um, okay, and we are now also inviting all the participants to provide your personal feedback in this Arise Plus Indonesia event. Please do scan the barcode and then please uh, input your, your feedback for our today's lecture to all the participants. And with that, lastly, on behalf of the host, we would like to apologize for the mistakes we have made throughout the event. And we sure do hope our today's discussion will bring a lot of insights uh, for us. And I, Azra, as your master of ceremony, once again, would like to say thank you very much and we wish you to have a great day. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom on Santi 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 Om. Namo Buddhaya. And thank you. May you have a, a nice day. Thank you. Absen, tolong ditaruh di depan yang rice plus sama yang ini juga absen. Takutnya mereka yang belum absen. Iya, bagus saya. Thank <laughs> you.